there's one all the way at the end. In the future, it just let's, let's fill all the way in at the end. All right. And good morning. Under the rules, the attorneys for both sides are permitted to make their opening statements, which shall consist of a brief statement of the nature of the case that the party expects to prove and the relief sought. Because of the unusual um, status of this case, I'm going to read a statement similar to the one I read to you yesterday morning. This is information from the court. Plaintiffs Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, the parents of one of the children murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School, have sued Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress caused by public statements made by Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC. You are not here to determine if Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC defamed or intentionally inflicted emotional distress on Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis. The court has already found that they have committed these acts. The jury's job will be to determine what sum of money, if any, would fairly and reasonably compensate Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis for the damages they incurred that were proximately caused by Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC conduct, as well as what sum of money, if any, should be assessed against Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC as punishment for their conduct. Ordinarily, at this stage of the case, the jury would hear all of the evidence on damages. In this case, some of the evidence will be presented after you decide compensatory damages and will be followed by a second charge of the court, okay, just so you understand what's going on. Now, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we always begin with the plaintiff. So, Mr. Bankston, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Bankston, and I'm here to talk to you about two rules first. Well, we would if we were clicking, wouldn't we? Uh oh. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see if we can get that going. Not a problem, Your Honor. said, Mark Bankston, I first want to talk to you about two rules. This is the first rule. You can't recklessly tell lies about someone. You can't do it. If you do it, and you cause someone damage, you're responsible. This is the second rule. You can't recklessly tell lies about something important to someone. In this case, like the death of their child. If you do that, you know you're going to cause them harm. You're responsible for that. You're here because those rules are broken. And they were broken in a way in which the world has never seen before. But before we get into that story, you're going to need to understand two things. Who is Alex Jones? What is InfoWars? This is Alex Jones and InfoWars. Alex Jones is one of the country's most popular and most influential media personalities. InfoWars is one of the nation's most popular and widely watched media networks. Now some of you may be forgiven for not knowing about Mr. Jones or the fact that InfoWars is one of our widely watched news networks. And the reason is, is because we now live in a world of bubbles. We now live in a world where we all watch different things. We don't all just turn on the news on one of the three major networks and watch it back in like the 1950s. We now live in a world where significant parts of this country get their information from things that other parts of the country would never even see. And over the last decade, Mr. Jones has become incredibly influential over a segment of this country. And the thing about Mr. Jones' business is it doesn't quite operate like most media businesses do. Right? Most media businesses are a bit different than Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones started on radio. Right? That's where he became a big star. But Mr. Jones was one of the first people in this country, of media people, to understand the internet and what it could do. And long before most me major media organizations even made their first steps into the internet, in the very early days of the 2000s, Mr. Jones was on the internet. And as a result, he has these radio shows 
a live broadcast nearly every day. He has an internet website, Infowars.com, where you can view videos, news articles. And he has a YouTube site, or at least he did until very recently, where he got billions of views on that page. The other thing that's different about Mr. Jones's business is that most media businesses make their money through advertising. And you're going to hear from the evidence in this case that Mr. Jones makes a little money that way. That's how they operate. But the main way that this business operates affects the news they cover. Because what they really do, the primary way the business operates is to sell products. As you see here on the screen, in Exhibit 15. This is an, another example that you'll see in the sidebar of the articles you'll see in this case. Here's a product called DNA Force. It, it claims it's going to overhaul your body's cellular engines and protect them from reactive oxygen species. Now, these kinds of products dictate the kind of news that has to be told on InfoWars, because you want to try to attract the audience that will buy these products. So that's what Mr. Jones did. His, his programming is very fantastical in some respects. In some respects, it's meant to convince you that powerful, shadowy forces in the world are out to get all of us and have put a cloak over reality. And Mr. Jones is going to take that cloak off and show you the real truth. That's, how his, that's what his media network's about. And for the past 10 years or so, Mr. Jones has become very influential. He has gained a position in media maybe unlike any other media figure in this country. And when he did that, 10 years ago, in 2012, when his popularity was truly exploding, Mr. Jones made a choice. And he made that choice. God, there we go. Made that choice on December 14th, 2012. That was the day of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Really one of the darkest days in American history. When you got to think back to 2012 when this happened, we've never seen anything like this before. I mean, the idea of someone coming in and slaughtering first graders, we were all, all of us, in like a collective state of shock over this. But not Mr. Jones. You see, Mr. Jones made a choice that day. Mr. Jones decided he was going to go on the air that day with the title of a video. And that video, was called Connecticut School Massacre. Looks like false flag, says witnesses. Now what's a false flag? It's actually, it's interesting, it's an older term, it's a naval term from the 17th, 16th, 16th century. And what it means is, let's say you were a Spanish ship and you wanted to attack a French ship, but you didn't want to get Spain in trouble. Well, what you could do is you could put up a British flag on your ship. You could fly a false flag. That's what that meant. So that you could attack the French ship without getting Spain in trouble. That's where the term comes from. But in the modern sense, in Mr. Jones's world, false flag now means something very different. A false flag is when a mass tragedy, <coughs> shooting, or bombing was actually staged by the United States government and particularly the Central Intelligence Agency. And that is fake. Didn't happen. I want to show you Mr. Jones on the day of Sandy Hook. As news was coming in of Sandy Hook, on his broadcast he called Connecticut School Massacre looks like false flag, says witnesses. And you'll see that Mr. Jones is talking to somebody who has a relative in Newtown. And he's trying to coax out the information to prove that this was a false flag. Let's take a look at that clip. I said, this is the attack. Look, people gotta find the clips the last two months. I said, they are launching attacks. They're getting ready. I can see them warming up with Obama. They've got a bigger majority in the Congress now in the Senate. They are going to come after our guns, look for mass shootings. And then magically it happens. They are coming, they are coming, they are coming. As you'll come to see, when Mr. Jones says magically it happened, that's sarcasm. Mr. Jones means that it was planned, that it was all staged, 
That's what he's talking about. And over the next couple of weeks, you will see in this case in, of, the, of the broadcast in 2012, that December, Mr. Jones continually was churning this idea that Sandy Hook was fake. By just one month after the shooting, Alex Jones, who would become patient zero for the Sandy Hook hoax, he had created a sensation. And by a month later, he had aired an entire episode entitled, Why People Think Sandy Hook is a Hoax. And for some of you, I think, and it hit me right at the beginning, is why? Why is he doing this? It's guns. It's about guns. Mr. Jones knew that his audience were worried about their guns. Maybe even rightly, they, they were worried about, you know, people who wanted to own AR-15s. Maybe there were going to be some new registration checks, or maybe they were going to ban the AR-15. Right? That's people that had that worry. But Mr. Jones played on that fear. He knew it. He knew they felt that. And so here's what he did. Jones told his audience that Obama was coming for their guns. So he told his audience that Obama staged Sandy Hook. And not that Obama ordered the murder of those children. But that there were never any children at all. That the school was fake. That it wasn't an operating school. The parents were liars, paid actors. Your Honor, may I approve this? No. Well, Your Honor, it's ordered that all demonstrative exhibits be shared with the other side before, and this PowerPoint was not. So. These are words that he's saying, overruled. Okay. And yeah, I have shared all the images in this. Document. Let's go back. Mr. Jones said that the school was fake. It wasn't an operating school. He said that the parents were liars, paid actors. He said the funerals were fake. Their tears were fake. Everything was fake. So that Mr. Jones could have this story on his broadcast. This was a massive campaign of lies. That's what the evidence is going to show. And in fact, it is difficult to wrap your head around it. We have brought for you, we're going to be showing you in this trial, dozens of videos. 44, I believe. We're going to try to show you before it's all over. And we can't show you all of them, and I'm going to tell you why. If we were to sit down and try to watch all the videos that we have about Sandy Hook, if I just put them on and let's play them and let you watch them, and we're going to spend the rest of this week doing it, we couldn't do it. We would not have enough time for you to sit here every single day and watch it. So I'm going to have to show you what I can I'm going to respect your time in that. And we're going to be showing you clips from over years and years and years, and we're going to try to give you the full breadth of what happened. And the other problem we face is we don't even have all the videos. We know there's more out there. You're going to hear testimony about that. You're going to hear expert witnesses talk about it. We don't have it all. We can only show you what we do have. Right? That we, no one really even knows how massive this was. Because some of that is lost to the sands of time. But this was done, this massive campaign of lies was accomplished because Mr. Jones recruited wild extremists from fringes of the internet who were willing to be as cruel as Mr. Jones needed them to be. The first one of these is a man named Wolfgang Halvig. You're going to hear a lot about this man during this trial. Wolfgang Halvig, you will hear, was a former Florida State Trooper. And then apparently he started some sort of security business. And Mr. Halvig was on InfoWars all the time. They just had him on over and over and over. Because Mr. Jones needed somebody who could pretend like they were going to support what he was saying. And Mr. Halvig was willing to do that for attention. I, I want to show you of the many, many times that Mr. Halvig was on. Let's first watch this first clip from September 25th, 2014 in an episode entitled, Connecticut PD has FBI falsify crime statistics. All right? And what you're going to see in this video is Mr. Jones describing Mr. Halbig, and then I want you to pay attention because you're going to see something very strange. You're going to see Mr. Jones do mocking imitations of the parents' crime to try to say that they're fake. 
You're going to see Mr. Jones say that there are photos of their children that prove that they're still alive, that they faked their deaths. Just take a look at what Mr. Jones said there. We're, we're fearless, folks. Support us. Support Wolfgang. This is not a game. This, they are hopping mad. We're covering this. CNN admits they did fake scud attacks on themselves back in 1991-1990. Would they stage this? I don't know. Do penguins live in Antarctica? Wolfgang W. Halbig is our guest, former state police officer in the North for the Customs Department, and then over the last decades created one of the biggest, most successful school safety training groups, and he just has gone and investigated, and it's just Bonnie has a $3 bill, and they've been... But man, Wolfgang, you dropped a bombshell of your scores of points, your, six, your 16 questions. If you've got a school of 100 kids, and then nobody can find them, and then you've got parents laughing on, <laughs> and then they walk over to the camera and go, <laughs> and, 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 and not just one, but a bunch of parents doing this, and then photos of kids that are still alive, they said died, I mean, they think we're so dumb that it's 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 really hidden in plain view. And so the preponderance, I, mean, I thought they had some scripting early on to exacerbate and milk the crisis, as Rahm Emanuel said. But when you really look at it, where are the lawsuits? There would be incredible lawsuits and payouts, but there haven't been any filed, nothing. I've never seen this. Uh, this is incredible. That's Mr. Halbig you're seeing on the screen right there. Mr. Halbig will come on the show and they'll do interviews. And we'll see some from Mr. Halbig, too. We're going to see some videos of him talking. But that's the guy that he would be bringing on these shows to talk about this over and over and over and over again. The following day, they published this article on Infowars.com. This article reads, FBI says no one killed at Sandy. Now... Let's just make this clear. Everyone now agrees. You're going to hear testimony from the author of this article. This is obviously wrong. You did, uh, you're, you're going to hear. You didn't read the chart right. You just didn't scroll down. And they went with this and put it up to their audience. And the important thing about this is this story was InfoWars' third most popular story ever. This was a viral sensation. Millions and millions of people saw this article. You're going to see the data on that. And when Mr. Jones realized the explosive popularity of these kinds of things, he doubled down. you got to remember, we're two years out from Sandy Hook. No network is covering Sandy Hook anymore. Mr. Jones, though, saw how this was doing with his audience. It became an obsession at InfoWars. You're going to see that there are parts of Mr. Jones' show. You know, he has his live show, and he has these internet videos he puts up, and he also says, you know, he does a radio show. So he has call-in guests sometimes, or call-in listeners, who will call in and talk about things with Mr. Jones. And they were eating the Sandy Hook stuff up with a spoon, and Mr. Jones kept inflaming it. Here's an example from December 29th, 2014. This was called America, the False Democracy. In this clip, you are going to hear Mr. Jones say that these children did not die. Sandy Hook is 100% fake. Uh, let's talk to uh, Kevin. Kevin, uh, go ahead. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, I'm uh, calling about Sandy Hook. Uh, basically, my take on it is I live about 50 miles from Newtown, and the whole thing is pretty much the next step in reality TV because with other false flags like 9-11 or Oklahoma City or the Boston bombing, at least something happened. With Sandy Hook, there's no there there. You've got a bunch of people walking around a parking lot. It's pretty much what it comes down to. And none of the no, no, I've had the t investigators on. I've had the state police have gone public. You name it. it. The whole thing is a giant hoax. And the problem is, how do you get, deal with a total hoax? I mean, it's just how do you even convince the public something's a total hoax? Very hard because you know, anytime I talk about this issue with people, you know, they you get criticized, blackballed, ridiculed, called every name in the book, or they respond with the magic words. They were staying on TV. There's no statement more proof positive of somebody who's been brainwashed by that stuff, mainstream media, than those words. They were staying on TV. Well, I always tell people the same thing: go out and prove the official story. And there's and I knew the millisecond this happened with that now fake picture of the kids being let out of the school. That this, there's nothing that's going to sell this agenda like dead elementary school kids. No, that's right. 
the general party. public doesn't know the school was actually closed the year before. They don't know they've shielded all, demolished the building. They don't know that uh, they had the kids going in circles in and out of the building as a photo op, blue screen, green screens they got caught using. I mean, the whole thing. But remember, this is the same White House that's been caught running the fake bin Laden raid that's come out and been faked. Uh, it's the same White House that got caught running all these other fake events over and over again. And it's the same White House that says, I never said that you can keep your doctor when he did say you keep your doctor. People just instinctively know that there's a lot of fraud going on. Uh, but it took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. I mean, even I couldn't believe it. I knew they jumped on it, used the crisis, hyped it up, but then I did deep research, and my gosh, it just pretty much didn't happen. This kept up in the 2015. The next part of our story. <clears throat> You'll see here another one of these call-in segments in an episode on January 13th, 2015. It was called Why We Accept Government Lies. Same kind of format here, except now Mr. Jones is starting to add new stuff. One of the things you'll hear in this video is that now Mr. Jones is saying that there were photos of a child in, at Sandy Hook that were used to stage a fake mass shooting in Pakistan. All right? It's confusing, but we'll get into it. I want you to take a look at this video from January 13, 2015. To make yeah, when well, you're trying to, to I mean, decipher cloak and dagger, dirty tricks, it, it's pretty hard to do. It's just that when you then you learn that they were funded by Western funding, the, then you learn that it was the same Amarillo Lockheed Connection underwear bomber, then those are big red flags that they were patsy provocateurs. The classic MO has been followed. And then, yeah, it kind of becomes a red herring, you know, to say the whole thing was staged. Because they have staged events before, but then you learn the school had been closed and reopened, and you got video of the kids going in circles in and out of the building, and they don't call the rescue choppers for two hours, and then they tear the building down and seal it, and they, they get caught using blue screens, and uh, an a email by Bloomberg comes out in the lawsuit where he's telling his people, get ready in the next 24 hours to capitalize on a shooting. Uh, yeah, so Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. I couldn't believe it at first. I knew they had actors there, clearly, but I thought they killed some real kids. And it just shows how bold they are that they clearly used actors. I mean, they even ended up using photos of kids killed in mass shootings here in a fake mass shooting in Turkey. So, yeah, or, 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 or Pakistan. The sky is now the limit. I appreciate your call. Shortly after this, InfoWars got its first YouTube strike. This means somebody made a complaint against the channel. In this case, it was a father of a victim. It was a father who had complained to InfoWars because their son's photo was used in one of their videos. It was this whole thing about the Pakistan shooting, and, and we'll get into that. It's not important now. It's obviously a lie. But when they used the son's picture, they complained to YouTube for copyright reasons. That's how they figured they could stop him. So YouTube issued him a strike. But InfoWars smartened up after this, and they realized don't use pictures of the children. That's what you're going to see. So from this point forward, you'll see Mr. Jones react about this and say, this is you know unjust to me, and I'm going to keep doing it. And it did. It kept up. Mr. Jones had Mr. Halbig all through 2015. And you'll see on March 4th, 2015, in this video, it's out of New Bombshell Sandy Hook Information Info. Now, I want, before we look at this video, I want to talk about, you've heard some of them already, Mr. Jones is going to keep repeating these same false claims. He's not questioning anything. You've got to make sure there's a big difference here. He's not questioning He's not going, hmm, something fishy might be going on at Sandy Hook. You don't have questions. He's just stating facts falsely. And here they are. You'll hear about Anderson Cooper on a blue screen. And you might know about blue screen from like Marvel movies. This is how they composite somebody into something. The argument here is that San Anderson Cooper of CNN did an interview with a parent in Newtown, and they weren't really in Newtown. They were really on a CNN studio in Atlanta, and they faked it and made it look like Anderson Cooper was there with the parent. But these people weren't even at Sandy Hook. It's a lie. You're going to see it's a lie. It's just an obvious lie. 
You're going to hear them talking about kids walking in circles, going around the building, doing, doing drills. And you're going to see the video he's talking about in, in his videos. He's going to play it. And what's most astonishing is the video he's showing, the building in the video, isn't even the Sandy Hook School. He's lied to his viewers. It's a firehouse in Newtown. And you're going to see that this video is hours later in the day when parents were showing up to pick up their kids, find out what happened. And there's a group of adults and teenagers and all walking around the building to get to the front of the building. And Mr. Jones tried to sell this to his audience to say that this was fake. It shows that it was the children were actually being let out of the front of the building and then back into the building. And he'll say, well, you should be getting them away from the building. It's not even Sandy Hook. He's going to say, talk about men in SWAT gear caught in the woods. But you're going to see video that proves that they actually knew that the video they're talking about, it's helicopter footage, was taken well into the afternoon, hours after the shooting, had nothing to do with the shooting, and you're going to find out it's some reporters who tried to get too close to the school to take pictures. It's all in the police reports. It's all public. But he tried to convince his viewers that these were um, CIA operatives or whatever in SWAT gear to facilitate the shooting or something. Whatever, whatever false thing you thought was going on here. Let's talk about how the school was actually closed. It was not an operating school. That they just opened it up for this day to stock it full of people and did like a stage production. But it was all not real. And, and it's these kind of statements that you're going to see in this case. And the, and the internal communications inside info, where they knew this was a lie. They're not... They're not that. They don't. They, they know there's copious evidence out there if you really go look for it that Sandy Hook was open. They were saying this knowing it was false. You'll hear him talk about a Michael Bloomberg email the day before. Michael Bloomberg is the former mayor of New York City. And part of what he has done since being mayor is he's been a real big gun control advocate. And they want to have their viewers believe that Michael Bloomberg sent an email to his supporters saying, Hey, 24 hours from now, we're going to have a mass shooting. Everybody get ready to mobilize on it. As if Michael Bloomberg had foreknowledge that they were going to fake this shooting. You're not going to see this email. Because obviously it doesn't exist. It's made up. Just a lie. You're going to hear about rescue helicopters. Why weren't the rescue helicopters called? But you're going to find out. Mr. Jones doesn't know where the rescue helicopters were coming from. He doesn't know how close the hospital was to Sandy Hook Elementary. And you're going to hear that those EMS, they would have gotten there way faster than a helicopter from way far away. You're going to hear all sorts of things about the ambulances and the EMTs. He tells his audience that they never even allowed EMTs in the building. And, and I'm guessing here is you don't have to get the EMTs in on the conspiracy, right? You just keep them out of the building, they'll never know it was all fake. EMTs went in that building. Anybody can verify it. It's not hard to figure that out. Most of them have given interviews about what they saw that day. It was the worst day of their lives. You're going to hear about that response that day. And yeah, EMTs were in there. He's going to tell you that they sealed the death certificates and that even owning one is a felony. That's on an InfoWars episode you're going to see. And the truth is, any one of you could right now get on, call up Newtown Clerk. Get one for twenty dollars. Any of the victims. It's just a lie. You're gonna hear him say, as you've already heard him say, that there are photos of the victims who are still alive. This is so disgusting, so repulsive, that I feel silly standing here and telling you that's false. But that's what I have to do in this case. That's where we're at. I'm going to show you a video of him saying all these things. This is when Mr. Halbert comes on the show again. And let's listen to what Mr. Jones has to say. Uh, Mr. Halbert, thanks for coming on. Recap who you are. Recap why you question kind of the top 10 or 15 points that I know are on your website uh, of, of why this doesn't add up. And, and, and then now they're really trying to, 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 to seal everything when they could discredit us any time they wanted to just tell us why Anderson Cooper's nose disappears, why it's blue screen. Uh, just tell us why the people are walking in circles in and out of the building. It appears to be staged. Tell us why they said they didn't catch somebody in the woods when they did. 
Uh, tell us why the school was closed before and then after, why they've sealed it all, why they've now torn it down. Tell us why Bloomberg sent out an email to his people the day before saying, get ready to launch an operation to capitalize on a mass shooting. Tell us why you didn't launch the emergency helicopters. Tell us why the, the ambulance was parked for, uh, for an hour down the road. Uh, tell us you know, tell us why this appears to be as phony as the $3 bill. Wolf K, thank you for joining us. And you'll notice these aren't questions. Tell us why this happened, because it did happen according to Mr. Jones. Be like if somebody came up to you and said, tell me why you're a thief. Tell me why you're a liar. Tell me why you're a murderer. It's not a question. That's not what Mr. Jones was doing. You're going to see that by November 2015, there was more people getting involved in this. As I told you, Mr. Jones was recruiting wild extremists from the fringes of the internet. One of those gentlemen was a man named Jim Fetzer. Jim Fetzer, InfoWars helped distribute his book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. Jim Fetzer was a former professor who, in his twilight years, started doing things like this. And wanted his stuff featured on Mr. Jones' show. And InfoWars wanted to help him. And you're going to see the internal emails in which InfoWars helps him distribute this book. This horrific book. The next month, it's important to know that at least a couple of people inside of InfoWars knew what was happening was wrong. They knew it. They didn't just know it. They warned them. Editor-at-large Paul Watson, the editor-at-large of the company, warned Mr. Jones in writing. Now, I know that's probably hard for some of y'all to see, so I'm going to read this to you. There's an email you will see. This is from Paul Watson, the editor at InfoWars, to Buckley at InfoWars, who's another managerial employee, and Anthony at InfoWars, who you'll hear is another managerial employee. And he says, send this to Alex. He says, this Sandy Hook stuff is killing us. It's promoted by the most batshit crazy people, like Rince and Fetzer, who all hate us anyway. Plus, it makes us look really bad to align with people who harass the parents of dead kids. It's going to hurt us with Drudge and bringing bigger names into the show. Plus, the event happened three years ago. Why even risk our reputation for it? And when he's talking about Drudge, some of you will probably know, he's talking about Drudge Report, um, a, a website that compiles news links. And if a media organization gets featured on Drudge, it gets a lot of traffic. So Mr. Watson wasn't so much concerned about the morality here. He was concerned it's going to make us look bad, and it's going to hurt us with Drudge. This is about money. This is about the bottom line. What he was trying to get Alex Jones to see. And... Mr. Watson had very good reason to be alarmed. Not just because of the things that were being said on InfoWars and the things that were being written, but what, what Mr. Jones was doing on top of it. And one of those things was sending his reporter to Newtown, Connecticut. <clears throat> and what you're going to see is that this reporter, Dan Badondi, who you will find out is a former professional wrestler, he went to Newtown and confronted people in Newtown. I want to show you a video of that. This is going to be Mr. Badondi following around Newtown City officials. And I want you to hear what he says to them. He's covering up the whole operation. They hacked Newtish with the helicopter, the line on the stand. Uh, that's perjury, sir. You know what perjury is? You're going to jail, criminal. Holy How far would you require me? And you, sir, have defended criminals. How do you feel about that? You know, you're, this guy here is somebody out of Central Cast in the fire. This is the exact person that they would hire to represent criminals, folks. The Sandy Hook truth is coming out. You people going to jail. You can smile all you want. You're going to jail for fraud. Plain and simple. Oh, you're looking at the credentials, Dan Bedani, the InfoWars.com, the number one alternative news source in the world. You know, live right on the wall. Live right on the air. What do you have to say about defending criminals? You're a bunch of frauds, a bunch of criminals. Enjoy your Federal Reserve notes now, scumbags. I right, see those people, folks. They're talking about Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook was an inside job. The thing about 
of this is, is that I think you can tell from this video, Mr. Badondi, that reporter, he probably believes this stuff. Like he's, he's being, Mr. Jones used him just as much as anybody. This poor guy, not, not maybe, you know, not the sharpest thinker sometimes, maybe believes this. Mr. Jones doesn't. He was happy to have this happen, and you will see that these videos are featured on Infowars where they bragged about scaring the people of Utah. <coughs> and it wasn't just editor Paul Watson warning Mr. Jones. The warnings came not only from Infowars employees, Mr. Jones and Infowars was warned by their viewers that what they were doing was wrong. <coughs> and you're going to hear about people who are online debunkers. People who were so horrified that they felt they wanted to make it their duty to try to debunk and disprove the things that InfoWars was saying. And those people also contacted the company and let them know in no uncertain terms the potential legal consequences from where this was headed. That happened. <coughs> but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that they warned them, told them that what they were doing was wrong, told them that what they were doing is false, because InfoWars already knew that. They already knew they were lying. They knew it was false. Here's the thing. You're going to see that you're going to hear testimony from the company that they admit they received a huge volume of emails from Wolfgang Halbig and Jim Fetzer that were crazy. And they knew that. And they admit it. And you're going to hear that they knew that Halbig and Fetzer and others were harassing the parents. <coughs> And they didn't care. It didn't bother them in the slightest. This kept up into 2016. And one of the things that you might remember about 2016 is the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Jones became a major topic during that election. Some of you may remember, in fact, that Mr. Jones' lies were discussed by Clinton in her campaign speeches. Mr. Jones didn't like this. <coughs> Mr. Jones fashions himself as a political enemy and rival of Hillary Clinton. And when she said this about him, he was mad. And he decided to respond. So he released a video on November 18, 2016. And it was called his final statement on Sandy Hook. It was not his final statement. It was very, very disturbing. You're going to see a couple things in this video. You're going to see that Mr. Jones, for the first time, directly addresses the complaints of the parents who have been outraged about this. And he's going to say about that 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 is suspicious. That they protest too much. That they must be hiding something. And at the end of this long rant, you're going to hear Mr. Jones look right into this camera, tell the people directly. He will address the people who say their parents that I see on TV. And what he says to them is, my heart would go out to you. But the problem is, I've seen actors before, and I know when I'm watching a movie, and I know when I'm watching something real. You'll see Mr. Jones nodding along with that. You'll hear him say, and why should anybody fear an investigation if they have nothing to hide. In fact, isn't that in Shakespeare's Hamlet? Methinks you protest too much. So here is my statement for the media when they call up saying, where do you stand on this? Where I've always stood. When there were other mass shootings, I would simply point out that they're very rare statistically and why should we all give up our rights? Because some other bad person does something. A guy with a car runs over 50 people. Do we ban driving cars? It's the same thing. And there have been other instances of shootings that are very suspicious. Aurora is one. Just look into that. But this particular case, they are so scared of investigation. So everything they do basically ends up blowing up in their face. So you guys are going to get what you want now. I'm going to start reinvestigating Sandy Hook and everything else that happened with it. I'm on the show signing off from InfoWars.com. If you're watching this transmission, think for yourself. I know it's a thought crime. And then ask yourself, what is it so strange about Sandy Hook and that tragedy? But I will
will say this finally, uh, my heart does go out to all parents that lose children, whether it's to stabbings or whether it's to car wrecks or whether it's to stranglings or whether it's to blunt force trauma or murder, uh, firearms, whatever the case is, I'm a parent and my heart goes out to all parents that have lost children uh, in these tragic events. And so if children were lost in Sandy Hook, my heart goes out to each and every one of those parents and the people that say they're parents that I see on the news. The only problem is I've watched a lot of soap operas and I've seen actors before. And I know when I'm watching a movie, I know when I'm watching something real. Let's look at the Sandy Hook. This man knew that the parents of murdered children were emotionally in distress, outraged, grieving, and he looked straight into that camera and he said, the only problem is I've watched a lot of soap operas and I've seen actors before. And I know when I'm watching a movie and I know when I'm watching something. Else. It kept going. It just kept going. It doesn't stop. 2017. And it's still going. They're still making videos saying it's phony as a $3 bill. In fact, one of those from that year that I want to talk to you about was called Sandy Hook Vampires Exposed. And in that video, Mr. Jones says that the media, the central intelligence, the, the parents that say their parents that he sees on the news, people who are the fake crisis actors, the people who are faking the interview of Anderson Cooper, they're all vampires of Sandy Hook. And he says, all the same fake stuff again. The school wasn't even open. It was rotting and falling apart. It didn't even look like a real school. And he asks, why haven't we seen pictures of bodies? Him and his news director, Mr. Dew, they wanted to see the bodies. And at this point, in 2017, they are at their breaking point. At this point, there had been an ongoing nationwide controversy that was all churned by Jones. There was Jones's public denial of their son's violent death. And they were getting harassment by Mr. Halbig and other followers of Jones. They were at the breaking point. And so Neil made a decision, a very tough decision. He made the decision on June 19, 2017, he decided he agreed to an interview with Megyn Kelly. I think some of y'all may remember Megyn Kelly used to have an NBC show. It's called Megyn Kelly Tonight. It's a news magazine. <laughs> and he thought, when Ms. Kelly asked him if he would come on the show, because she was doing a profile about Mr. Jones, he thought, if I go on this show and I say, please stop, please stop, I'm a real dad, he thought if Mr. Jones was be able to look him in the eyes and see him, that he could solve this. And so he went on this Kelly show in front of a national televised audience and said, look, I'm a real dad. I, I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Please stop. And Neil was hopeful. Neil was really hopeful that it would stop. It did not. On June 25th, 2017, InfoWars struck back directly at Mr. Hesselman. They retaliated. And they did it in a disgusting way. They aired a video that said, talked about Neil's interview on Megyn Kelly and said, hmm, one problem. Mr. Heslin's a liar. Mr. Heslin never held his child. He made up that story. And we can prove it. Because you see, according to InfoWars' version of events, the shooting was fake, and all these fake actor parents, who were like paid actors of the CIA, were given a cover story. And one of the easiest parts of their cover story, apparently, was that they didn't release the bodies of the children to the parents. And the idea being, if you don't have to worry about the bodies and all that sort of stuff, it makes it easier to pull off this fakery. So they had all these paid actors say, we never got the children, the bodies never released them. But the allegation here is that Mr. Heslin 
forgot his cover story and said something that wasn't true, that he held his child. They did this by deceptively editing video interviews. The first is of this man. You're going to see this in these videos are played. I'm going to play you this video about Mr. Hustle. And this man is Dr. Wayne Carver. He is the medical examiner who had the incredibly difficult job of seeing those children after seeing them. And what you're going to see, the evidence will show you that, that Dr. Carver in this interview was talking about the process by which the children were identified. All right? They got all the children, and they got to get the parents into contact. Right? And he was talking about how the way you do that is through photograph. Right? You don't want, the reason you do that is it's thus traumatic, and you don't want to bring a parent into the room of a body of a child that's not theirs. Right? So you want to do this by photograph. Make sure that you get them lined up before you do that. And as you'll hear, he'll even say, there's a time and a place for up close and personal. But first you identify by photograph. They actually edited this video in such a way to make it look like, oh no, the parents were only shown photographs of their children, or that was a story in any way. And it's actually just a complete deception, sleight of hand, by editing this man's interview. They do the same thing with these parents. This is Lynn and Christine McDonald. And Lynn and Christine McDonald, you'll see in this interview, we're talking about the process of being at the funeral home of their daughter and her casket. And, you know, as a mom, when your child has suffered these kinds of injuries, you have to make a very difficult decision. And that decision is whether to open that casket. And Miss McDonald made a decision not to. And you're going to hear, you'll have, you'll hear expert testimony talking about this interview, where you'll see that Miss McDonald wanted her little daughter, she wanted to remember her just the way she was. So she didn't look. And what InfoWars did is they took her interview and they cut her off mid-sentence and made it look like she was never allowed to see her children. Both of these things, all of this stuff you're going to see in this video came from this anonymous blog post that had information from that gentleman, Jim Fetzer who InfoWars, you'll hear testimony, that they knew, at the time they published this broadcast, they knew Mr. Fetzer was crazy, completely unreliable. They didn't care. They were doing this to retaliate against Neil, who had the temerity, the audacity, to stand up on national television and tell him to stop. That's what this was for. I want you to see that video. Let's play that now. So folks, now, here's another story. You know, I don't even know if Alex knows about this, to be honest with you. Alex, if you're listening and you want to, uh, or if you just want to know what's going on, Zero Hedge has just published a story. Megyn Kelly fails to fact check Sandy Hook's, Sandy Hook father's contradictory claim in Alex Jones' hit piece. Now again, this, this broke I think it broke today, I don't know what time, but featured in Megyn Kelly's expose, Neil Heslin, a father of one of the victims, during the interview described what happened the day of the shooting, and basically what he said, the statement he made, fact checkers on this have said cannot be accurate. He's claiming that he held his son and saw the bullet hole in his head. That is his claim. Now, according to a timeline of events and a coroner's testimony, that is not possible. And so one must look at Megyn Kelly and say, Megyn, I think it's time for you to explain this contradiction in the narrative. Because this is only going to fuel the conspiracy theory that you're trying to put out, in fact. So, and here's the thing, too. You would remember, let me see how long these clips are. You would remember if you held your dead kid in, in your hands with a bullet hole. That's not something that you would just misspeak on. So let's roll the clip first. 
Neil Heslin telling Megan Kelly of his experience with his with uh, with his kid at Sandy Hook Elementary School. One of the darkest chapters in American history was a hoax. I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Neil Heslin's son Jesse, just six years old, was murdered, along with 19 of his classmates and six adults, on December 14, 2012, in Newtown, Connecticut. Yeah, I dropped him off at 904. That's when we dropped him off at school. With his book bag. Um, hours later, I was picking him up in a body bag. Okay, so making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Now, here is an account from the coroner that does not cooperate with that narrative. Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them, um, of, of their facial features. You have, uh, uh, it's, it's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, there is uh, a time and a place for a close and personal in the grieving process. But to accomplish this, uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way. And uh, you can sort of, uh, you can control the situation. It's going to be you know, hard not to have been able to actually see her. Well, at first I thought that, and I had questioned maybe wanting to see her. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook, the conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event. That's just a fact. So there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. The man you just saw, his name is Owen Schroeder. He's another media star at Infowars, sort of Mr. Jones' protege. And what you just saw there was a manufactured, fabricated lie, specifically engineered and calculated to hurt Neil Heslin and Scarlett Rose, to retaliate against Neil for daring to speak out, proposing any sort of resistance to Mr. Jones' years of cruelty. They struck back against him. And it didn't end there. Right? Now, now Neil and his family had been introduced into the Sandy Hook conspiracy. They were a key part of it now. They were a focus of this lie. And it didn't end. A month later, you're going to see that there was significant controversy over this video you just saw. And Mr. Jones, a month later, doubled down and defended it. He got on a show, he played that entire video again, and then he said this. He said, that was a month ago. He, meaning Mr. Schroyer, had said, I wouldn't hold my breath looking for a response. We've not seen a clarification. Mr. Jones then said, the stuff I found was they never let them see their body. This is Jesse. And the thing that I think is really important to understand about Neil and Scarlett's state of mind when this video came out is, you know, obviously Neil is talking about the last moments he spent with his little boy. And Alex Jones came along and he took that memory that rather beautiful memory, and he ruined it, and he tarnished it, and he made it ugly. And now every single time that Neil Heslin has to think about the last moments he spent with Jesse, he also has to think about this horrible memory, this disgusting series of lies that will be ever, forever tied to his son's death. 
that Jesse's legacy had now become tied to this. That there would always be an asterisk next to his name. That there would be this contingent of people who would come out of the woodwork and decide they needed to confront Neil and Scarlett about this. And Neil and Scarlett spent the next years up until the day they're sitting in this courthouse dealing with this fallout. Of having all of these people think that they're liars, crisis actors, CIA agents, and their son Jesse didn't even live. I want to talk about what this trial means. Because there has never been anything like this. All right? There are lots of defamation cases in the past. It is, in fact, our oldest human law. Objection to argument, Your Honor. Defamation is one of the oldest laws we have in human society. Many of you know it in another form, in its earliest form from the dawn of man. We do not bear false witness against our neighbors. We believe that as a people, and we have since the moment we all started sitting down and living in cities together. And in the modern form, we see defamation cases. And that would, you know, sometimes be about a news article, or a book, or a video on TV, or in some cases, maybe a couple of articles, or a series of videos. But never, never in the human history of defamation has somebody for 10 years over and over and over to a global audience harassed, lied, and attacked the parents of murdered children for 10 years, causing huge portions of this country and indeed the globe to doubt them and their story. It has never happened. Where people are showing up and confronting the parents of murdered children in public, threatening their lives, it's never happened. This trial is different than anything that's ever gone on in this courtroom. And you're not here to decide whether all this happened. I think we all know that now. We're going to see the videos. Nobody doubts that the videos were published. You're going to see the black and white documents. You're going to see the internal emails. But you're not going to have to decide whether all this happened. And you know that you're not here to decide whether Mr. Jones is legally responsible. It's also not something you need to decide. And this also has nothing to do with the Constitution, because defamation is not protected by freedom of speech. Okay? We decided that long ago as a people. It, it actually recalls some of the words written by our old Chief Justice, William Rehnquist, the former Chief Justice of the United States. And he wrote, he wrote in Hustler versus Falwell. Your Honor, same objection to argument. Um, I'm going to allow it, but make sure you... It's very brief, Your Honor. Okay. In Hustler versus Fall, Just, Justice Rehnquist said this, false statements of fact are particularly valueless. They interfere with the truth-seeking function of the marketplace of ideas, and they cause damage to an individual's reputation that cannot be easily be repaired by counter speech, however persuasive or effective. It's for that reason that we do not protect defamation, false speech. Because speech is free, but lies you have to pay for. There is also no <coughs> question that Neil and Scarlett suffered harm. I don't know what InfoWars lawyers are going to get up here and say. I don't. But one thing I know they will not tell you is that Neil and Scarlett weren't harmed by this. That's not going to happen. They won't tell you that. Because we all know that happened. And the testimony will show that free speech systems admits that its conduct harmed the plaintiffs. They'll admit what they did to these parents' grieving process. They'll admit it. They just don't care. And they do not believe that they should have to pay anything beyond a dollar for it. They think that the pain that they admit that they caused has no value. None. 
They're going to stand up here after the things that you've just seen, admitting that they did wrong, admitting that they caused the harm, and they're going to have the absolute gall to say, give them a dog. That's what they're going to do. You have two tasks. There's two things you've got to do while you're in this quarter. The first task is how much money should Neil and Scarlett be paid for the harm Mr. Jones has caused? The second thing you're going to have to consider is how much money will it take to punish Mr. Jones for his actions? That's it. Those are the only two things you're here to do today through this trial. And I want to talk really briefly about the burden of proof for doing that, because that came up a little bit during jury selection. And you'll notice they use this term, preponderance of the evidence. And ever since I came out of law school long ago, I do not know why we use words like that. That is dumb. Why do we talk that way? It really, because there's such an easy way to say it, and I think everybody in the courtroom will agree with me, <coughs> the defense counsel will agree, that what preponderance of the evidence means is, is a fact more likely true than not true. Just a slight tipping of the scales. If you think you could flip a coin flip and it's better than those odds, that's more likely true than not true. And that's how we decide things in a civil court. Obviously, most of the things, like about whether he did something wrong or whether these videos are published, you won't have to decide that. So this actually isn't going to be that difficult in this case because the evidence that you're going to see is going to fill up that scale you see that's pushing down. It's going to weigh it way down, because what goes in that part of the scale is the harm to Neil and Scarlett. And the evidence of that is overwhelming. You're going to be hearing a lot about it. You see, Mr. Jones knew that his lies would damage Neil's reputation. He knew that. He knew that if he cast Neil and his family in the middle of this Sandy Hook lie, that millions of people across this country were going to believe it, that they're going to harass these people, that their lives are going to get more difficult, not because of what was going on in their minds, but what was going on in the minds of the millions of people who saw this. He knew that damage would happen. He doesn't care. He thinks it's worth a dollar. What I want you to remember about this is this number. 24%. You are going to hear expert testimony in this case. That will tell you that that number, 24%, at the time all these events were happening, is the percent of people in this country who believe that Sandy Hook was either definitely or possibly staged. One in four Americans. And you're going to hear expert testimony that Mr. Jones was the only voice of any importance whatsoever, the only commercial media figure at all, to spread these lies. That there was, these were things that were confined to the weird corners of the internet, bizarre Facebook groups and weird little YouTube videos and you know these crank professors writing their anonymous blogs. Nobody with millions and millions and millions of followers. And nobody was doing it. It was Mr. Jones. And you're going to hear expert testimony that Mr. Jones and his conduct is the nearly exclusive driver of this. That as Mr. Jones put that out, and his followers put that out, and it spread like a virus through the internet. And you're going to hear how had it not been for Mr. Jones, this number would be trivial. Because it would have never gone beyond the most crazy places on the internet. And you're going to hear how for 10 years, Mr. Jones's lies have inspired his guests to harass Neil and Scarlett. That's something you're going to hear. You're going to hear how guests and viewers who believed Mr. Jones' lies contacted Neil and Scarlett at home, that they accosted them in public. They harassed them online and by telephone, and that they threatened their very lives. Mr. Jones knew that his lies about Jesse's death would cause severe emotional distress to Neil and Scarlett. He didn't just knew it, he intended it. Intended to inflict emotional distress. This was his goal. It wasn't that he committed an accident. It wasn't that he was just not careful. He intended to hurt them 
and now he wants to pay a dollar. But for 10 years, Mr. Jones has robbed Neil and Scarlett of the time they needed to heal over the violent death of their son, Jesse, because Mr. Jones wanted to sell more of his products. That's the reality. You're going to hear how Mr. Jones' lies caused Neil and Scarlett to get stuck in loops of negative thinking about Jesse's death. And what we mean by this is when your thoughts don't have an off switch. You're going to hear expert psychological testimony, medical testimony from medical experts, that what this is called is forced rumination. Rumination is obsessive thinking about a tragic situation when it interferes with your normal functioning. And that's what was happening to Neil and Scarlett over the past 10 years. For 10 years, Jones has used his campaign of lies about the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting to force <coughs> Neil and Scarlett to ruminate about the violent loss of their son, Jesse. Whenever Neil encounters the Sandy Hook lie, he can think of nothing else. And whenever Scarlett encounters the Sandy Hook lie, she shuts down and isolates. It didn't have to be this way. I want to make crystal clear to all of you. We are not here today to seek compensation for the death of their child and the grief that comes along with losing a child. A lot of parents lose children way more than we want. It's accidents disease, firearms. We've actually gotten to the point where firearms is the leading cause of death of children. Parents have to deal with this. And yes, it's horrible. But with qualified medical intervention and time, you can heal. You don't get better. You just heal. You develop scar tissue. You come to a place of closure. You come to a place of acceptance. And the grief will always be with you. But if you can do it in a healthy way, the outcomes for a parent who's lost a child you're going to hear are, are okay. You can get them to be in an okay place. People like Neil and Scarlett can heal over time if they are allowed to shape their past and present circumstances. But Neil and Scarlett were prevented from healing because they had to contend with Alex Jones' lies. Dealing with this conspiracy of lies for 10 years put a lot of life stressors on Neil and Scarlett, which led to a substantial decline in their well-being and caused them to continually suffer aggravated mental anguish. That is what you will hear from a medical professional, psychological professional, I'm going to tell you this. And that's one of the other things you're going to compensate for in this case. We talked a lot about mental anguish yesterday, but it's that and the reputation, right? It's about what went on in their minds. That's the mental anguish. But in the millions of other people's minds, that's the reputation damage. Both of those things happened to Neil and Scarlett. That's not the only thing you're going to have to consider. You're going to hear evidence over the next coming days that relates to the things you'll need to consider for punitive damages. And as we talked about, these are the damages designed to punish the defendant and also to deter, to convince every other media organization that if they go down this path, if they try to copy Mr. Jones's formula, it will not be a good thing for them. Hopefully, this trial will be able to deter and prevent any other media organizations from following the same cruel path. Because what you have to remember is that Mr. Jones, for 10 years, intentionally lied that the shooting was fake or a government-led plot. When I say 10 years, it's because I want you to understand this hasn't stopped. Bringing this lawsuit did not solve this. You can look at what Mr. Jones has said afterwards, and you can see inside of his mind and know how malicious he was, because he is still saying Sandy Hook is synthetic. I want to show you a video from October 1st, 2021, just last year. 
And when Mr. Jones says that, you know what? My original instinct was right. You know, at first I thought it was fake. Then I thought maybe it's real. And, and now, he says, seeing how fake and synthetic everything is, maybe I was right. Maybe Alex Jones is always right. That's what you're about to hear him say. I'm going to show you this video from October 1st, 2021. Just like the New York Times lying about WMDs on purpose and all the evil things that, oh, but I questioned one of the big events they hyped up because of a lot of the anomalies, and I have a right to question that. In fact, I, for a while, thought it didn't happen, then I thought it probably did, and now, seeing how synthetic everything is, maybe my original instinct, maybe Alex Jones is always I'm pretty much right 99% of the time, folks, and so are you. I mean, we all know this is easy to look at to see what's happening. And you've seen him here today, Mr. Jones still nodding along. Mr. Jones, you'll hear, he still thinks. It's a cover-up, Sandy Hook. Keeps pushing it, because it's important that his audience not hear him retract. It's important that if he was to go out and say, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, I, I need to be accountable. That will destroy him with his audience. He can't do it. He won't do it. <clears throat> You need to understand that he intentionally lied to sell supplements. That's what he did. Mr. Jones used Jesse's death to sell his products. That is the reality. And Mr. Jones retaliated against Neil for speaking out. Mr. Jones told the world that Neil was lying about holding Jesse's body. Because Mr. Jones will do or say anything to protect his ability to profit off his lies. This is a case about creating change. You have the power to stop this from ever happening again. You can put an end to these lies by punishing Alex Jones. You can make that part of Jesse's legacy. You can make Jesse's legacy this trial, in which he can hopefully, Jesse's legacy, can prevent this from ever happening to another family, to another set of victims. That can be Jesse's legacy. But just as importantly is compensating Neil and Scarlett for the harm that they suffered. And I remember when we were talking in jury selection, when my partner, Mr. Ball, was talking to me. We were, a lot of us were talking about how it's difficult to wrap your mind around something abstract, like mental anguish, reputation damages. And I know one of the things you're going to find out, that's going to be, that's why we all are for. We're going to tell you everything we can. We're going to give you all the instructions we can. We're going to show you all the evidence. But it's going to be up to you. And one of the ways that I think Right now, obviously, I'm just an opening statement. I can't show you everything. But one of the things I think you should think about, a number you should keep in mind, something to help wrap your head around this level of damage, is this number, that 24%. The number of people in this country who believe that Sandy Hook was definitely or possibly staged. This pool of people who do not believe in Scarlet, Scarlett, these pool of people who doubt them, from out of which come these followers who harass them. That group of people is 75 million people. And we would submit to you that a fair measure, analysis, of the level of harm that was done to Neil's reputation out of all of this is one dollar for every one of those people. Just one dollar. 75 million. And we would submit to you, too, that the emotional damage that was done to Neil and Scarlett, which you will hear through, through medical experts, we'd submit to you that that is at least as valuable as what happened to their reputation. At least. In this case, that has never had anything like this ever happen. Another 75 million. And that is why, at the end of evidence, we're going to come and we're going to ask you for a verdict of $150 million. Now, that is a huge verdict, to be sure. But it is one that will do justice to the level of harm done in this case. 
harm that was done to the parents of grieving parents of murdered children who have had to endure for 10 years the most despicable and vile campaign of defamation and slander in American history. We look forward to telling you their story. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Bankston. We are going to take our morning break. It is 10.50. We're going to break for 20 minutes. For my jury, remember all of my instructions. This is still a uh, no discussion time. So you can go after that door as soon as this magic deal comes in um, and be ready to come back at 11.10. Thank you. All right. Whoever is last, make sure you shut that door behind you, please. Thank you. All right, you may be seated. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. At this time, the defense would move for a mistrial based on a violation of the Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Chapter 31.0011. Mr. Bankston's opening statement squarely put before the jury um, content that the Civil Practice and Remedies Code that the Texas Legislature says should not be in an opening statement in the first case, uh, first part of a bifurcated trial, uh, and therefore we'd ask for a mistrial. Right, well, this is not, as we, as we have discussed at length, a traditional bifurcated trial. The only element, the only issue, and the only type of evidence that is bifurcated is the evidence on Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems net worth, which was not discussed in the opening statement. The motion is denied. Thank you. And just to remind you that we'll need to take up a quick thing about the board here. That's fine. If I stand up, everybody stands up. Thank you. anybody can't read my handwriting that says do not lie to the jury if you hope to get the verdict that you've requested what we heard was a conspiracy of lies the truth is going to come from that witness stand it's going to be in the documents the records the evidence my mentor who I'm lucky enough to have sitting at this table with me, told me a long time ago to keep track of the other side's opening statement and write down their misrepresentations so you can come back to the jury in closing argument and show them where they haven't kept their word. You see, a lawyer's opening statement is not like a politician's speech. You don't get to see if the politician is going to keep her word before you vote for her. You get to see if we keep our word before you vote in this case. My name is Andino Reynal, and I am honored to represent Alex Jones and FSS. 
He is one of the most polarizing figures in this nation. And I am honored to represent him, not because I agree with everything that he says, but because I believe in his right to say it, and I believe in every American's right to choose what they watch, and what they listen to, and what they believe. Mr. Bankston's first lie came at 9.37 AM, when he said that InfoWars was one of the most significant networks in the USA. In fact, the evidence will show that in 2018, InfoWars was completely deplatformed. You will not find InfoWars on YouTube. You will not find InfoWars on Facebook. You will not find InfoWars on Twitter. You will find it absolutely nowhere. Mr. Jones has been canceled, punished for statements that are related to this case. Statements we don't dispute were wrong. But in order to render a just verdict, you need to understand and be able to see all the evidence and understand the chain of events and understand what he said and when he said it. I'm going to take my time, and I promise not to go on for too long, <coughs> to first tell you a little bit about this case, go through a timeline of events, and then lay out why we believe the evidence will show that we should receive your verdict. On December 14th, 2012, <coughs> Adam Lanza, a mentally disturbed young man in Connecticut, woke up early. He got a 22 caliber bolt action rifle, <coughs> went to his mother's room, and shot her in the head while she was sleeping. He then armed himself with a long gun and two pistols. And some reports say he drove by the high school where he'd been a student, saw two police cars, and diverted to the elementary school. He shot his way in and killed 20 first graders, six-year-olds, and six school employees. In the span of 10 minutes, he created pain that would last a lifetime. Alex Jones was 1,500 miles away in Austin, Texas, dropping off his own six-year-old at school. When he heard <coughs> about the event, he was shocked and saddened just like everyone else in America. He was also suspicious. Alex Jones has hosted a show called InfoWars since the late 1990s. He started out on Austin Public Access. InfoWars is a talk show where Alex Jones discusses, and, and some of the people who work with him, discuss conspiracy theories, and they discuss government cover-ups, and they discuss lies told by the mainstream media, and they try to give an alternative view. Mostly it's a college. So let's discuss what happened and go through the years. I want to clarify something. Because you're going to watch the videos. The videos are the most important part of this. Not cherry picking little snippets, but actually watching the videos. And I hope you hold the plaintiff's account. You're going to hear that Alex Jones was concerned about the government's response on the day of Sandy Hook. You're going to hear that he suspected 
the government, but he thought the government might have been involved. You are not going to hear him say that he didn't think any kids were killed at any time in 2012 or 2013, okay? So when you watch those videos, and watch them, when he says staged an attack, he means they committed an attack, okay? When he says false flag, he means the government attacked its own citizens to try and achieve a political act. Alex Jones doesn't trust the government. Millions of Americans don't trust the government. So let's talk about 2012. And the first thing I want to talk about is what happened in the immediate aftermath of the Sandy Hook. There was, and you'll, you'll see Alex, you'll be able to watch his response to it. Like him, everyone was heartbroken across the nation and across the world. And they showed their sympathy for the people of Newtown, Connecticut. You will hear from the witness stand, there were over 500,000 letters, cards, drawings. There were so many toys sent to the town because it had happened right around Christmas. So many toys sent around the town that they had to get a separate, they had to get a separate mail sorting facility to distribute the toys to other places. Millions of dollars went to the United Way to support the family members. President Obama got on a jet and flew there the next day. I mean, not to mention every senator from Connecticut, every mayor, uh, every town politician, people from around the world gathered to mourn. The mainstream media also went. Unfortunately, Some of the people who went to Sandy Hook, and the evidence is going to show that Sandy Hook wasn't different from any other school trip. I mean, we live in a nation divide. If you're blue, every time there's a school shooting, it's America is the most dangerous place in the world, and we need to ban the AR. And if you're red, every time there's a school shooting, it's, again, here they are, taking advantage of a tragedy to try and infringe upon our rights. Unfortunately, that's just the way things work in this country. And it was no different at Sandy Hook. Hours after the event, CNN, every major news source was there, <coughs> interviewing people, broadcasting. The evidence is going to show calling for gun legislation. InfoWars, back in Austin, was also covering it in 2012 and 2013. It was big news. And InfoWars, never contested that the children were murdered in 2012 or 2013. You'll watch the videos. I, I, I was, frankly, I was surprised. I don't have them ready to play. You'll watch them, okay? Assess them yourself. They were covering it, and they were saying that it was being botched, mishandled, and used to push gun legislation. And you'll here, from the witness stand, they will admit to you that the investigation and the coverage of the event was botched at first. 
I mean, I don't know what we have now. There's an enormous report. But you will hear covered that CNN misidentified the shooter and put this man's picture up from Hoboken, New Jersey for four hours and said that he was the real killer. You will hear that there was another, well, at least they reported that there was another man in handcuffs outside. You will hear that it was reported, and you'll see it in the video, that there were people who were arrested. There was chaos. And we all know that that's what happens after these events, okay? Unfortunately, in this case, the chaos, the bad coverage, led a lot of people to doubt. became known as truthers or the truth community. These were hundreds or even thousands of Americans who got together on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube and discussed the event and pointed out what they saw as inconsistencies in it that they believed suggested that there was a cover up, that the government wasn't being forthright about what it happened. Okay? And some of these people are very, very extreme. Okay? They are. I want to mention four people in particular because they were leading members of the truth community. All right? They were all over YouTube. And you'll hear that some of the videos they made got 10 million views. This was big news, and InfoWars was covering it, was covering the questions that people had, because InfoWars believes in people's right to question information. And they were interviewing these people and saying, hey, you have questions about Sandy Hook. What are they? Okay. Now, there did come a time when Alex was taken in, right, and did become for a time, one of those people. We're not hiding that. But it wasn't in 2012, and it wasn't in 2013. The four people are Dr. James Fetzer, who was a professor at the University of Minnesota at the time. Dr. James Tracy, who was a professor at Atlantic Florida University of Media Studies at the time. Wolfgang Halbig, who you'll see, who was a Florida state trooper, who did work for the Seminole County Education Board, and who claimed to be a school safety expert who had been interviewed on multiple channels and had even testified before Congress. Some of that now, 2020 hindsight, I don't think is true. Okay, But he presented himself that way at the time. And if you understand the news cycle and how it works, commentators, people on talk shows, they get information, they run with it. Alex Jones was wrong to believe these people. But he didn't do it out of spite. The evidence will show that he did it because he believed it, because he thought it was important coverage, because he thought that these people had a right to say what they were doing, that a citizen has a right to get on InfoWars and talk about what their questions are. So let's talk about the bad facts. I mean, we talked about brutal honesty.
2014 to 2015 in the summer for the rest of the year. Alex Jones has apologized repeatedly for the coverage that he gave to Sandy Hook from 2014 to the summer of 2015. And he has every reason. He does. They trusted people that they shouldn't have trusted. It created a lot of tension at his company. There were arguments about it. But he felt the show was important, and he aired it. He regrets that now, and he said so. The thing you have to remember about Alex, is that he has been talking about conspiracy theories and taking on the elites, whether that is the Bush administration or the Obama administration or the Clinton administration. He's been the outsider for a really long time. And by the time we get to 2014 and 2015, he felt he had seen what he perceived as so many lies and so many cover-ups and so much hand-washing of the facts that he had become biased. He was looking at the world through dirty glasses. And if you look at the world through dirty glasses, everything you see is dirty. Important for you to know, I don't think there's any evidence that is going to come from that witness stand that Mr. Heslin or Miss Lewis ever watched this show during this period. And I can assure you that there will be no evidence that Mr. Jones or any member of his staff named Mr. Heslin or Miss Lewis during this time. Okay. So just to recap where we are, 2012-2013, InfoWars is covering Sandy Hook with a slant that children were really murdered but there's a government cover-up and potentially government involvement. That doesn't say that Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis aren't the parents of a dead child. It doesn't. So we get to this period, and it ends in July. After July, we have quiet from InfoWars on this topic. Yeah. I'll object to the reasons you just discussed about the motion to declare that InfoWars was quiet from July until the murder. I'm free to discuss what I believe the evidence will show, Your Honor. You are free to discuss what the evidence will show, but liability has been established in this case, and you are close to the edge on that. <coughs> Let's talk about twenty sixteen. Election year is a very contested election. And Mr. Jones, for the first time in his entire career, supported a candidate. And he was associated with Donald Trump. Hillary 
saw that as a liability for Trump and made Alex a big part of her campaign, saying that Alex had repeatedly said on his show that Sandy Hook hadn't happened. By this point, Alex didn't believe in that. So on November 18, 2016, he put out a video called Final Statement on Sandy Hook. And you'll have the opportunity to watch that video. And I think you should insist on watching that video in its totality, just like every video that's going to come into evidence. Because only then can you understand what really happened. You can't cherry pick. And he said, I want to reach out to the victims of criminal crimes and listeners to clarify where I stand on Sandy Hook. The last three or four years, the mainstream media has made attacks against me that I said no one died. I've hosted debates with both sides of the aisles. I've always said I'm not really sure of what happened. I can see based on the evidence why people might say nobody died, but I don't know what happened. I know mass shootings happen. The official story, however, of Sandy Hook has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. And he still believes that. That's it. Only statement on Sandy Hook for the whole year. <laughs> Megan Kelly is no friend to Donald Trump. And she decided that she was going to run a hit piece on Alex Jones about this issue. Alex Jones hadn't brought it up since November. She brought it up. She decided to air a show where she would confront Alex, who she got to interview by misrepresenting the purpose of the story, and juxtapose it with an interview with Mr. Heslin. <coughs> Alex had never said Mr. Heslin's name. He'd never said Miss Lewis's name. The show is about to air. And before it airs, Alex says, I, I need to clear the air because this is going to misrepresent me. And he says, in a piece, I believe children died there. So the show airs, and afterwards, a young reporter at InfoWars sees an article on a website called Zero Hedge. And that article is in evidence. Uh. And the judge has already found InfoWars, or Free Speech Systems, parent company for InfoWars, and Alex Jones guilty for those statements. But you are free to consider the intent with which they were made in determining whether they were made maliciously or in good faith. And you're going to hear from the reporter who made the statements. Your Honor, I'm going to have to object again to the comment. So you're going to have to explain the difference between defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Intentional infliction of emotional distress, for which Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC have already been found liable, includes the state of mind of the actor which means it has already been established that the acts they took 
to inflict the emotional distress were intentional. Defamation does not include that in the same way. So you're going to have to clarify that if you're going to go down that path. I, I think the court has already clarified. Let me see. This is the article. It's in evidence. I'm going to move this because I'm sure that most of you can't see it. And basically, the article, you'll have it, you can read it, you know, you can fact check me. But basically, the article says that Megyn Kelly isn't doing a good job fact checking her sources because she didn't run down a seeming inconsistency between what the coroner said about the parents not being brought into contact with the bodies on the day of the shooting and what Mr. Heslin said about holding his child on the day of the shooting. And interestingly, It states, Alex Jones' official position is that he believes children die in the shooting. In fact, during a 2014 account of a hearing before the Newtown Board of Education, an InfoWars journalist did not dispute that Adam Lanza had perpetrated the shooting. almost there are four big reasons why I'm going to come back to you at the end of this case and ask for your verdict. The first reason is because when you look at the totality of the coverage the evidence will be that InfoWars' coverage of the Sandy Hook incident between 2012 and 2018 was less than one half of 1% of its total coverage. It was barely 27 hours. I can object again. This is iron, iron. He, he can say this. He's got to show it. OK. Thank you, Your Honor. Less than one half. And remember rule number one, the lawyer who lies deserves to, rule, to lose. Okay? Less than one half of 1% of total coverage on the show. Okay. And important to add to that is remember, you got CNN and Fox and... and every other newscast covering this issue, right? especially back in 2013. And InfoWars is a, is a whisper in a hurricane. Point number two. The Sandy, the no one died at Sandy Hook lie did not begin with Mr. Fitz. It began with Fetzer and Tracy and Halbig and a guy named Steve Pachenik, who was a former State Department official and a psychiatrist. They were four of the most prominent among thousands of people who were saying this on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. Given that, it brings me to point number three. You are still allowed to decide how much damage 
Alex Jones caused. And in doing so, you can assess whether his words made their way to the ears of the plaintiffs. You can assess whether anybody was moved to act by anything that Alex Jones said. And the evidence will show that he did not cause the harassment. Number four, Mr. Bankston, the personal injury lawyer, talked about this a little bit. Actual damages. The first question you're going to be asked to answer is actual damages. You will see no evidence that it was Alex Jones, the talk show host, and not Adam Lanza, the mass murderer, that caused the mental anguish that is honestly suffered by Mr. Heslin and Mr. Heslin. The videos are so important. Watch. I want to, before I sit down, I want to make a couple more points. Number one, Alex Jones has apologized repeatedly for what he said. And I expect he'll do so again here. Alex Jones has already been punished. He, because of this case, He lost all his access to the internet. Millions of dollars. Canceled. He regrets what he did. And he's paying a price for it. He's paying a price for it today. He pays a price for it every time somebody on the street chases him and says, you killed the children at Sandy Hook. And throws coffee on him. And because he's been canceled, nobody can hear his side of the story. Nobody can see the texture of reality. We are not cardboard cutouts. We are all real, complex people. People make mistakes. They pay for it. They want to tell you this is the great Satan. This man is not a cardboard cutout. He's a human being just like every one of us with his own ideas. You will be able to decide. And I want you to ask yourself, at the end of this case, is this an honest attempt by personal injury lawyers to get just compensation for damages that were actually experienced? Or is this a cynical attempt by personal injury lawyers to enrich themselves while silencing a political opponent and limiting every American's right to choose what they watch and what they listen to. I look forward to presenting this case today. All right. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Before we break, I see people with gum in their mouth. 
it's clearly stated on the door, there is no eating, there is no gum in this courtroom. If I see it again, I'll stop, I'm talking, sir. The, the number one rule in court, fair or not, is when the judge is talking, nobody else is. Even if I interrupt someone. There is no chewing gum, there is no soda, there is no eating in this courtroom. If I see it again, I'll have you removed. There is no recording of any kind of the YouTube feed or the proceedings in this courtroom without prior written permission signed by me. No photographs, no audio recording, no video recording. So I'm not taking away everyone's phones in the room, but if we find out that you're doing one of those things, you will be removed. There is no um, talking to, talking in front of, or approaching by anyone of my jury. If somebody does that in the courthouse, they will be removed until this trial is over. Just want to make that very clear to everyone. We're going to break for lunch. It's noon. We're going to break until 1.30. My jury can go ahead and head on out. If the lawyers need me right now. every time. Raise your right hand to be sworn, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Come have a seat here, Mr. Troyer. Once you do, you'll see there's glass cups, they're not glasses, and water. Thirsty. There are microphones. If you have a pretty good projection, you shouldn't need to lean in too much. I'll let you know if you do. A couple of more instructions in case you haven't testified before. It's not a conversation. It's a question and an answer. So you have to listen to the question and answer the question that you're asked. Do you understand that? Yes. You also have to let the question be completed before you begin your answer, even if you think you know what you're being asked. So you have to let them completely finish asking, take a beat, and then answer. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. I also need you to answer out loud in words, so head shakes and ahams make for a poor record. Do you understand that? Thank you so much. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Ball. Farrah, I'm sorry, it's Mr. Okay. Farrah. It's okay. There's so many people. I'm. So, I knew that. I knew that, I, and I just. I just want. I didn't want to check my notes again. Look, I should have. Face I'm so sorry. Okay. I, my apologies, Mr. Farrah. Mr. Troyer, would you introduce yourself to the jury, please? My name is Owen Troyer. I work for InfoWars. I'm 33 years old. When you say you work for InfoWars, your actual employer is Free Speech Systems LLC, correct? Correct. So we, we're going to kind of use InfoWars as slang because it's InfoWars.com and that's sort of the, the name out in the community. But just to be clear, the, the broadcasts that go up, uh, the one that you did today or yesterday, those are Free Speech System LLC's broadcasts, correct? Yes. You work for InfoWars or Free Speech Systems. I'm just going to call it InfoWars. Can we, can we make that agreement? Yes. And know that we're, we really mean free speech, okay? Yes. You've worked for them since 2016, correct? Correct. What is your current title? Show host and reporter. Okay. Show host means you're on the air, right? Correct. All right. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, I hate to ask you this in a public forum, but I, I need to. Can you tell us what your salary is? Um, I don't know the exact number, but I believe it's about 120000 a year before taxes. Um, Ms. Karpova just testified there's around 50 to 80 employees at uh, Free Speech Systems or InfoWars, correct? Um, I don't know the exact number, but I would say at least 50, yes. Okay, and that's been the same since you've been there since 2016, roughly? Yes. All right. Uh, Alex Jones <coughs> is the sole owner of Free Speech Systems LLC, correct? Yes, I believe so, yes. Um, Infowars.com is obviously on the internet, right? Correct. If somebody said that Infowars lost all access to the internet, that would be an incorrect statement. Fair? Yes. Have you ever heard the saying, lawyers that lie should lose? I don't believe I've heard that. I, I neither until Tuesday. I thought it was interesting, though. Um, InfoWars is on it, it, on right now, right? I and mean, we can pull it up and there's there's a video of somebody who's probably on live right now, right? Yes. Your Honor, I'd like to welcome InfoWars in for the crime one. Um, just this is for demonstrative. Okay. I'm pulling he up wants to show InfoWars on, on mute. 
And you're, this is a direct connection to the internet, I take it? It is. Okay. So this is, I'm not going to walk over. This is Infowars.com, the, the, the home page. It's active, it's up, it's live, it has been since. <coughs> As far as you work, why don't you work for the company, right? I'm sorry, I was distracted looking at the screen. Can you repeat that? Yeah, it's my fault. It has been active and live for as long as you've been working for the company, right? Infowars.com? Yes. Okay. And you create content. If you click on <coughs> band, band video, this is the content that's created and uploaded to band.com every day, correct? Uh, yes, band.video. Band out video. It's hard to see, but if police if, if we'll scroll down just a little bit, you can see how long, obviously the names, how long they are, and when they were uploaded. That's good. So I know the jury can't see this, so I'm just going to say it out loud. Up here is 17 minutes and change, uh, uploaded an hour ago. Uh, 13 minutes and some change, uploaded two hours ago. Eight minutes and change, uploaded an hour ago, two hours ago, hour ago. So forth. So, and you guys make a lot of content every single day, right? Yes. Half since you've been there, right? Yes. There's not been any um, limitation to your ability to make videos and put them on Infowars.com, correct? Um, the videos go to band.video. Sometimes we'll write articles that embed the video to Infowars.com. Okay. Um, bandvideo.com is owned by Free Speech Systems also, correct? Uh, Band.video, I believe, is owned by Free Speech Systems, but I, I, I don't know that. Okay, that. Point, point is that there's no sort of drop in ability to make content and put it on your website for your viewers to watch. It hasn't been since 2015 since you started, correct? Or 16? For us to upload content to Band.video? Yes, sir. Uh, no, other than tech issues on our end. And then one of the things that are really the only real source of revenue for InfoWars or free speech is, can you go back, Lisa? Is your store, InfoWars store, correct? Yes. Will you click on that? No, we got to prove we're not a robot. <laughs> Put me on the spot, Lisa. <laughs> Robots deciding whether we're robots or not. Mr. Chair, you talk pretty fast. If you'll just down. try to be careful, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just want to adjust a little bit, if you wouldn't do so. So we see uh, we have a diet force <coughs> meal. How do you pronounce this middle one? Bodies. Bodies. Um, some toothpaste. Is this the toothpaste that you guys claim cured COVID? Is that a different one? No. That's a different one? Um, I'm not familiar with that claim. You're not familiar with the FDA and state attorneys general saying stop making that claim? Oh, could I see that claim presented in front of me? That's not important. Oh. If you go up to the top a little bit, Melissa, um, there's different things. There's preparedness, media, specials, gear. Um, just different items that InfoWars sells, and that is really their source of revenue, right? Yes. Okay. During the broadcast, sometimes there will be breaks to promote different items, right? Different things that you sell in your store, correct? Yeah, we have breaks where we run commercials that feature our products. Sometimes it's just live, kind of as you're going. Uh, Mr. Jones will just say, also buy this pill or supplement or whatever it may be, right? Sure, that's referred to as a live read. Okay. It, I've heard it said that about a third of the content, the third of the show, is some form of advertisement for supplements or whatever it is you guys sell. Does that seem about right to you? No. You think it's less? Yeah. 25%? Probably less. Okay. I'm in the ballpark. I, I really, I mean, that's, you're getting into math, but if I was... I'd say it's probably maybe 10, 15 percent for the most. Okay. Lisa, you can take that one down. Um, how long have you been hosting shows live on Infowars? The show that I host is called The War Room. That launched in September of 2017. I would fill in as a guest host 
on other InfoWars live shows previously to that, but that was not a regular thing. You co-host with Mr. Jones often, correct? Uh, I've been a guest on Alex's show, yes. You would call it a guest? Whenever, let's take, for example, Tuesday afternoon, while we were here in court, you and Mr. Jones were live for three hours, right? Um, I, I don't remember the exact amount of time. Aren't your segments three hours? No, the segments were about ten minutes. Okay. You were live for three hours, and that's uploaded to bandvideo.com, right? Which day are we speaking? We're talking about Tuesday, which was the 26th. I took a screenshot of you and Alex on it. I've marked this as plaintiff's exhibit 124. It's not on the exhibit list, Your Honor, because it obviously just happened Tuesday. Right. So um, thank you. Sure. What? 124? Yes, Your Honor. I'll try okay. to get the next one. That's fine. Uh, does this look like a screenshot of you and Alex, uh, or Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, uh, from Tuesday? Yes. And um, we're going to move to uh, PS124, at least. Any objections? No. Uh, plaintiff's 124 is admitted. Do you remember the show? Yes. Okay, so for three hours, you were on for three hours. Does that seem right? I don't want to misrepresent it. I think Tuesday I was on for seven hours. Sure. This this show was three hours, and then you did another 30-minute special with just you and Mr. Jones, really, about this trial, right? I don't recall the exact content of the discussion. Okay. Do you remember yesterday having my website up and talking bad about me and my partners? Yesterday? The day before, I guess it was. Uh, again, I don't recall, like I said, I was on air for seven hours, so there was a lot discussed. With that. Okay. So this is the studio with uh, the TVs Ms. Carbova talked about and the fancy graphics, right? Yes. Because you guys are a media company. You can do fancy graphics, right? Yes. Oh, and, and then there's links to things you sell. Instahard, that's a pill you guys sell? I'm not too familiar with the product, it's a new one, but I guess it's a pill. Okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It is a product, though, that we sell, yes. Fair enough. Uh, Diet Force, something you sell? Yes. Do you have any idea where that stuff's sourced from? InfoWars Life? The pills. You mean the, the, the actual the inside actual pills. the ingredients? Yeah. yeah. You don't? No. Yeah. Do you know if any of the stuff is approved by the FDA by chance? I don't. Do you know if any of it's been tested to see if it's effective or any good at all? Well, we test the product for ourselves. You mean you take it? Yes. And you're still here, so it must be okay? Yeah, it works for me. every day, well, since this trial started on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and even this morning, Alex Jones has been on live broadcast, right? I'm not sure. Which day are you not sure about? Um, yesterday. Uh, Let me show you what I marked as plaintiff. Day. Let me show you what I marked as plaintiff. 126. <coughs> This is a screenshot from a show that Mr. Jones was on yesterday. Correct? You can see the date, 727? Yes. Uh, we'll move 126 in evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Relevance and also when this show was taped? When this show was taped is not an objection. So relevance. Foundation. Overruled. And um, 126 is admitted. You put 126 up. Just putting it up to point out that uh, Mr. Jones was on the show yesterday uh, when he went in court. Did you know when he stormed out of court today, he went and was on the show again today? Uh, no, I was not watching. Okay. 
we could probably pull it up on the band video and see, but we take my word for it that he was live today. Sure. In fact, he was with Mr. Barnes, who I think I saw in the courtroom. Yeah, Mr. Barnes back there, the, his, his former attorney, right? I, I can't see Mr. Barnes. Uh, you maybe he's right behind the camera. <clears throat> I'll have to take your word for it. She's a perfect blockade. Yeah, he's right there. Or he, sorry. Excuse me, don't want this jury. Did you know that one of the first things this jury was told was Mr. Jones won't be at this trial very much because of a medical condition? I'm unaware. Truth is, he's not at the trial much because he's on air selling pills, right? I'm not, I, I'm not sure. That's where he is when he's not here. I mean, we just established that, right? Today? Well, I know you don't know he was here today. Let's talk about Tuesday and Wednesday, okay? Okay. When he wasn't in trial, he was on air saying whatever he's saying and trying to sell pills or supplements or whatever products you guys have, correct? I'm trying to recall correctly. I believe Monday, I don't know if he was on air Monday, and I think Tuesday he may have had pre-recorded segments that we aired. Um, that's my up. best recollection of Monday and Tuesday. If the show on Tuesday <coughs> happened in court on Tuesday, it wasn't pre-reported, right? Uh, okay, yes. Okay. You, you, you hosted with him. It's, can you put up 124? I mean, Mr. Shorter, you lived this, right? That's you sitting right next to Alex Jones at 124, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You know when you did it. Did you do it Tuesday? Uh, I, I guess that was Tuesday. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's all been a blur when I'm on seven hours a day, and then I'm sitting in the courthouse for seven hours, eight hours. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just kind of a blur. I understand. And I know you've been here for a couple of days, and I apologize for making you wait because I know you have to sit outside. How much content does InfoWars make a day? We have 10 hours of live transmissions every day, and then there might be some other reports as well. Ooh, did it. <coughs> Do you consider yourself a journalist? Sometimes. That's an interesting answer. Can you give me a little bit of an explanation? Sure. When I go to cover a live event at the scene, I've covered sporting events, I've covered, covered weather events, political events. I would consider that journalism when I'm live on the scene doing something. But when I'm hosting a talk show, not necessarily a journalist. Okay. It's like saying whenever I go home and go to bed, I'm not a lawyer. I'm still a lawyer, right? Do you consider yourself a journalist by trade? Sometimes. Okay. Would you agree with me that it is not right for a journalist to edit video clips to fit an agenda? Yeah, that would be bad. Okay. It is not good practice for a journalist to take an edited video clip not ask any questions about it, not do any fact checking, and air it. Agree with that? Yes. Because when you do that, mistakes are made, right? Yes. And when mistakes are made, people get hurt, right? Sometimes. Sometimes, right? That damage can be serious, right? Sometimes. Life changing, right? Sometimes. Devastating, right? Sometimes. Right. You don't consider yourself a conspiracy theorist, fair? Sometimes. Mr. Shorter, I'm going to hand you a notebook. I just got this deposition report because it's a winning bitter. I'm going to hand you a notebook so it may make things easier. In front of it is your, under tab one, is your deposition that you gave in this case. You're called to give a deposition? Yes. I'm just going to show you because sometimes people don't know exactly how these pages work. If you look, these, these are the page numbers. It's 14, 16, 14, 17, and the lines. And I'm going to orient you to a couple pages and lines, okay? Sure. Right now, if you go to page 151, did you say line or page? I'm sorry, it's the wrong page anyway. Oh, yeah, page 151, line 14. And I, or you were asked, this is December 2nd, 2021, you were asked, do you think you're a conspiracy theorist? Your answer? No. Okay. That's what you said under oath December of last year, right? Yes. Are you changing that? To, have you become a conspiracy theorist in that last uh, seven years? 
No. Just stick with that. Yes. That's really difficult. Let's try this again. Everyone, please remember, put every device off or on silent before you walk in the courtroom. I'm going to ask the question again. Or leave it somewhere else. That's what I do. I'll ask the question again from the start. Do you consider yourself a conspiracy theorist? No. Okay. You do, however, consider CNN a conspiracy theorist, right? Sometimes. You go to page 164. I'm not going to read the question because it's long. You can see the answer on 24, 25. You say, well, I would say CNN is a conspiracy theorist. How about that? That's what you said, right? Yep. Still agree with that? Yes. Okay. You did a show on June 25th, 2017, where you were the sole host. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, that was a Sunday, correct? Yes. Which is why you were doing it at the time, right? I'm sorry, what? Is that, that's why you were hosting because it was a Sunday? Um, no. The Sunday Alex Jones show has been on air for a long time. I was filling in that night. Okay. It airs from 4 to 6 Central Time? Yes. This is the one where you challenge whether or not Neil Heslin ever held his son, Jesse. Right? No. I uh, challenge that the videos presented didn't add up and that Megyn Kelly had done harm to the story being uh, removed from the public consciousness and just caused it to be brought up again. I'm not going to quibble about you because we're going to watch it. It is the show about Neil Hessler and whether or not he held Jesse his arms, right? That's what the show's about, or that segment's about. Um, not the whole at show. Least the last yeah. four minutes, yeah. It was the last four minutes? I believe so, yes. Of the, of the four to six? Yes. Okay. This show was on InfoWars, correct? Yes. So Free Speech Systems is the one that's publishing that, correct? Yes. Before you did that show, you had no idea who Neil Hesley was, right? Correct. You were, I mean, you didn't care who you were talking about. Yes, what I just said is correct. You didn't care who you're talking about. Can you rephrase the question or repeat it? Did you care who you're talking about? Yes. Did you care that you're talking about Neil Hessler? <clears throat> yes. Why don't you go to page 110 of your deposition? You know you're under oath here, right? Yes. Okay. You know you were under oath when you gave this deposition, right? Yes. Explain sir. <coughs> Line three through six, I'll read the question. Okay, so you didn't care who you were talking about. What was your answer? I was just covering a story that was given to me. You didn't care who you were talking about. It didn't matter to you, right? No, I didn't say that. Okay. You were handed the story while you were on air live. You ran with it, right? Yes. You did zero to determine if it was accurate, right? Correct. You did no betting of the story at all, correct? Correct. You did nothing to determine if it was a joke or a parody, right? Correct. There are video clips in it. You didn't watch them, right? Correct. Before you played them. Correct. How many people do you think were watching that day? Millions? Tens of millions? I don't know. How many people do you think were watching that day? A couple hundred thousand. You know the reach. You're going to sit there under oath and say a couple hundred thousand? Well, I'm, I'm under oath to tell the truth, and the truth is I don't know. Okay. You don't know. You know it's over a million. You know it's closer to 10 million, right? No, I don't know that. Okay. You didn't check the source, right? You're referring to Zero Hedge? Right. You didn't check the source. You didn't check the author. Well, I mean, I, I saw it said Zero Hedge on it. Okay, that's the website, right? Yes. That's not where it originated from, though, right? Um, well, to me it was. It wasn't the question. It's not where it originated from, right? Well, it was published on Zero Hedge. That's where I saw it. But, obviously, 
I understand the author was, I believe something called Zero Point Now. Right. I think it's a real name. I doubt it. Right. So somebody called Zero Point Now writes something on a website called iBank Coin, which is then picked up by Zero Hedge. You do absolutely nothing to determine if any words in this have any accuracy at all, and you play it on air and make comments about it. Right? Yes. Let's play 23. PBX 23. It's in Evan John. Now, here's another story. You know, I don't even know if Alex knows about this, to be honest with you. Alex, if you're listening and you want to, uh, or if you just want to know what's going on, Zero Hedge has just published a story. Megyn Kelly fails to fact check Sandy Hook's Sandy Hook father's contradictory claim in Alex Jones' hit piece. Now, again, this, this broke... I think it broke today, I don't know what time, but featured in Megyn Kelly's expose, Neil Heslin, a father of one of the victims, during the interview described what happened the day of the shooting, and basically what he said, the statement he made, fact checkers on this have said cannot be accurate. He's claiming that he held his son and saw the bullet hole in his head. That is his claim. Now, according to a timeline of events and a coroner's testimony, that is not possible. And so one must look at Megyn Kelly and say, Megyn, I think it's time for you to explain this contradiction in the narrative. Because this is only going to fuel the conspiracy theory that you're trying to put out, in fact. So, and here's the thing, too. You would remember, let me see how long these clips are. You would remember if you held your dead kid in, in your hands with a bullet hole. That's not something that you would just misspeak on. So let's roll the clip first. Neil Heslin telling Megyn Kelly of his experience with his, with, uh, with his kid. At Sandy Hook Elementary School, one of the darkest chapters in American history was a hoax. I washed my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Neil Heslin's son Jesse, just six years old, was murdered, along with 19 of his classmates and six adults, on December 14th, 2012, in Newtown, Connecticut. Yeah, I dropped him off at 9.04. That's when we dropped him off at school. With his book bag. Um, hours later, I was... Okay, so making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Now, here is an account from the coroner that does not cooperate with that narrative. Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them, um, of, of their facial features. It's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, there is uh, a time and a place for a close and personal in the grieving process. But to accomplish this, uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way. And uh, you can sort of, uh, you can control the situation uh, depending on your photographer. I have very good photographers. Uh, but uh, it's got to be not to have been able to actually see her. Well, at first I thought that, and I had questioned maybe wanting to see her. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook, the conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event, that's just a fact, so there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. 
So now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. After four years of re research, the next big game changer has arrived. Sea Shield Toxic Metal and Chemical Defense Support. It's made in the USA. It's filled with known compounds from nature that are absolutely associated with detoxifying the body, and it supports the info work. It is a classic whole 360 win. We're changing the world. Now it's time to change our bodies with Z Shield. InfoWarsLife.com. So right after you called Neil Heslin a liar, played a commercial to, to sell Z-Force, Z-Shield. Can you back that up, Lisa? Objection, CPRC 4111. The same? Yeah. Okay, overruled. May I have a running objection? Yes. Stop it. Correct? Uh, no. Because you don't think you called Dale Hudson a liar, right? I didn't. Right after you ran that piece, and we'll get to that part, right after we ran that piece, you ran that piece, you ran a commercial trying to sell z Steel <coughs> Toxic Metal and Chemical Defense Support, right? I didn't run that. That was probably pre-programmed into our commercial system. Free Speech Systems, right after they had you say the things that you said about Neil Hessler, right after that, they ran a commercial for a product that they sell on their website called Z-Shield, right? Well, yes. When we go to a break, we run commercials. Right. Because InfoWars is actually an infomercial, right? No. I want to look at the source. Can you put up PX20, which is in evidence? This is the article. And if it's useful to you, just have a... Have four in your notebook there. Okay. Lisa, can you, can you blow up where it says, actually, yeah, can you blow up where it says uh, content originally? Content originally published at ibankcoin.com. You see that? <clears throat> which, uh, which page is this one? It's also uh, on your screen. Four, yes, it's true. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It may be easier that way. I see that, yes. Okay. That is not a reliable source. You and I can agree on that, right? Uh, yes. Okay. The author we've talked about before, and really set up on the top. By zero point now. Um, you have no idea who that is, right? No. You have no idea if they're a reliable source or not, right? No. You've never heard of that person before. Or at least so, no. Pseudo name or whatever it may be, right? You've definitely never run a story by zero point now before, correct? I don't believe so. This was republished, as you said, by a website called Zero Hedge, right? Yes. Also, not a reliable source, correct? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't, right? Perhaps. So let me ask you this: If I have, if you get something from a source and you're, and you look and say, you know, this source sometimes is reliable, sometimes they're way out there and unreliable. Isn't it a incumbent on you to check it and do some sort of vetting before you put it on here? Yes, I could have done a better job. You could have done a job, right? You did nothing. You could have done something, right? Well, I was live on air at the time, so it was given to me, and I covered it. Is it an excuse to say I didn't have time? Is, is that an excuse to defamation, to defaming Mr. Heslin? Is that an excuse to you? I just didn't have time? Can you repeat or rephrase the question? Is it an excuse to say I didn't have time? Is that a proper excuse to go defame somebody? No. Is it a proper excuse to devastate them? I just didn't have time. I don't agree that that's what happened. Which part? That he was devastated? That I had, that even if I had the time, then I wouldn't have run the story. So it would never run. It comes to me, I'm on air. Time's of the essence, is what you're saying. Got to get that new story going now, right? 
got to get to the end to sell the metal ions, right? Whether I covered this story or not, that commercial was going to run. Well, the difference is whether you covered it or not is if we're sitting here today. That's the difference, right? Can you repeat the question? The difference is it doesn't destroy these people if you don't run the story, right? I don't know. That PowerPoint's up. I think we can agree on some points that, you, that, that we agree on before you ran the story. You had one never heard of this or Correct? Yes. Never heard of Mr. Heslin, correct? Correct. You did nothing to fact check the accuracy of this report or story, correct? Correct. You didn't watch the, the video clips, right? Not prior to the second. Did InfoWars cut those clips? I do not know. So editors of InfoWars, as far as you know, could have been the one who cut those clips. Because you know they were cut, right? It's my understanding that they were cut by whoever published the story. You know they were cut, right? Well, yeah, the video clips. Yeah, you know this, the, the interview, we're going to get to it, with, with Dr. Carver, the medical examiner? That's 15 and a half minutes long, right? I, I don't know that. You know it's a lot longer than what was shown on that story, right? Yes. Okay. You know the, um, the, the family, the, the McDonald family, that lost their daughter, Grace. Do you understand that? Okay. You believe that? Do I believe what? That they lost their daughter, Grace. Yes. Okay. You know that that was a long interview with Anderson Cooper, right? Again, I was not familiar with the interview prior. Do you, sitting on this seat right now, know that that interview with um, Anderson Cooper was significantly longer than what was played? I will take your word for it. Do you know that her answer, Ms. McDonald's answer, was actually cut off and get answer? There's a lot more to that answer that explains what she's saying? No. Did you know that what she's saying is she didn't want to open the casket at the funeral home to bring all the toys that she brought for Grace to put them in there because she wanted to remember the way she looked when she went to school that day. You know that? No, I'm not aware. Because you didn't do anything to find out, right? Yes. You may not have even actually read the article before you put it up, right? Started just kind of reading as you're going? I don't recall for sure, but yeah, could be the case. You've never heard of I Bank Point, right? Yes. And you never heard of the author Zero Point Now, correct? Yes. Despite that, you had no problem putting that on the air, right? Yes. You have testified, I think you just tried to say it again earlier, you don't believe you called Neil Hessen a liar, right? Yes. I want to play a couple of clips out of this. I, I want to, let's be clear. That piece and what you say in it is, is Neil Heslin did not hold the sun, right? I don't believe I said that. That's what the message is. Let's take the full message, whether it come from the article, the clips, or you. The message is Neil Heslin never held Jesse, right? No. What's the message? The message is that the intention of Megyn Kelly to bury these conspiracy theorists failed miserably, and it's going to make it worse. So you're... We know this, right? This is this we can agree on. Alex Jones was angry at Megyn Kelly for that piece that ran, right? On him? I don't know. I, I'm sure. It, I'm sure that Alex Jones was unhappy that he was lied to by Megyn Kelly. He was. He was pissed. I mean, yeah, he was lied to, right? So he wanted to give retaliation to Megyn Kelly, right? No. If he had to stomp on Neil Heslin on the way to do it, so be it, right? That's what happened. No. What you had to try to say, because what you're, what you're not saying is that Neil Heslin lost his son and he just didn't hold him, that that's a lie. What you're saying is he's a crisis actor who forgot his lines. That's never, what you're saying. I never said that. That's the message. No, it's not. Because to, to say it's a hoax, to say it's a hoax, you have to say all these people are actors. And when you find a glitch in the matrix, when somebody says something just a little bit wrong that you think is out of character, out of line, they forgot their lines, that's the attack. That he's an actor, right? No, I never said he was an actor. I never said it was a hoax. Hey, video clip one, please.
he's claiming that he held his son and saw the bullet hole in his head. That is his claim. Okay, so making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Those are two parts that are spliced together, but the point is both times you say he's claiming, right? Yes. Right, so that's like a, you're saying it, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. He's, he's, that's his claim. Not that it happened. He's claiming it happened, right? Well, yeah, that's what he claimed. I'm not doubting that. I never said that so, he was a liar. To be clear, I, I just want to make sure I understand this perfectly. When you three times say he's claiming it, and then show evidence that you say refutes it, you're saying you're not doubting it. I didn't show evidence that refuted his claim. I showed evidence that was presented to me that says this doesn't add up. You don't think an edited clip of the coroner saying uh, the parents were never united with the kids and a clip of a mom saying I didn't get to see the child is evidence to refute his claims that he held Jesse. That's what your testimony is. Under oath to these 14 folks, 16 folks. Can you repeat the question? I'll try. You're saying that playing the coroner's clip saying that the parents and the children are never united, and also playing a mother's interview where she said she did not get to see her daughter Grace, right after you say he claims to help Jesse, you don't say that that's evidence that he's not being truthful? No. And what was in my head that day was never that. The only thing that was in my head that day was questioning Megan Kelly because she lied to Alex about what she was doing there. And then here, the conspiracy theory that she was trying to bury is rearing its ugly head again. I could have done a much better job that day. Absolutely. I probably should have known more about those videos and that story before I ran it. But I never called Mr. Heslin a liar. I never said Sandy Hook didn't happen. I never said that they were crisis actors. Your response to it's the same. You just said it was. You just said it was to get back at Megan Kelly because she lied to Alex Jones. That's what you just said, right? Okay. That's what this was about. It was to get back at Megan Kelly, and if you stomp on some people on the way, who cares? You didn't even know who he was, right? I wasn't trying to stomp on anybody. <coughs> it's not a matter of what you're trying to do. It's the result that matters, right? Well, when do we begin? What's the result of what? Play a quick video, call video too, please. So, and here's the thing too. You would remember, I want to see how long these clips are. You would remember if you held your dead kid in, in your hands with a bullet hole. That's not something that you would just misspeak on. No, I said you wouldn't misspeak. Okay. So what you're saying is, is Neil Hessel was telling the truth the whole time. That, that's your position. Now that, that's what this. That's what this whole piece, from start to finish, the message anybody should get is that Neil Hessel is telling the truth. I am taking a neutral mm -hmm. approach to this, and I'm simply saying that is a serious memory in your head that you would not forget. And then you challenge that it ever happened. Because you say the parents weren't allowed to see their kids, right? You put on evidence that the parents weren't allowed to see the kids, right? I played a clip of the coroner saying that the kids weren't released or that the bodies weren't released, so just as easily you can infer that the coroner was lying. And then you played the family, the grieving mother, who said that she wanted to see her child and decided not to, right? Yes, that clip follows. And you cut it off whenever you explain what it was actually talking about. Right? Uh, I did not edit that clip. Somebody did. You played it. Uh, yes. You don't know who edited it, right? I mean, no. could have been somebody in free speech, could have been somebody else. Uh, I don't know. Okay. A couple more clips I want to play. Can you go to the full one and just stop it at 43 seconds? Can, can you just tell me which exhibit we're Sure. Playing? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the same. <coughs> just the same 20. Um, 23. 23. Okay. PX 23. <coughs> I 
time, but featured in Megyn Kelly's expose. Two things I want to point out. You see this three shares? Yes. All right, this isn't an article that's sort of breaking the internet, right? Uh, I guess not. All right. You see the time that was published, 3.35 p.m.? Yes. That was the same day, right? Yes. Uh, that's probably Eastern time, wouldn't you think? I don't know. Okay, let's call it 3.35 Central. Make it more favorable. You said you published this around 5.55, right? Uh, I believe so. So, InfoWars, somebody, your folks in the back, I don't know what you call them, writers or editors or whatever it may be, had hours to try to fact check this before they handed it to me, right? Not necessarily. They might not have seen it until 5.35. Okay. And they had 20 minutes. They might not have seen it until 5.55. All right. You think they just printed it as hot off the presses and threw it to you? Most likely, yes. Okay. We saw with this Karpova earlier today that... Uh, the defense played a clip of Alex Jones saying that he gives his sincere condolences to the family. Are you familiar with that clip? I have heard Alex Jones apologize and, and basically correct himself many times. Let, yes. Let's be clear, that was not an apology. An apology is, I'm sorry for what I did. Sincere condolences is not an apology. It's something, but it's not an apology, right? <laughs> If I said, I'm sorry for your loss, I'm not apologizing to you. <clears throat> Fair? That sounds like an apology to me. If you lost a loved one, and I came over and I said, Mr. Schroyer, I'm really sorry for your loss. That's not an apology. I would say it is. Okay. What am I apologizing for? If, if, if your loved one died, and I said, Mr. Schroeder, I'm sorry for your loss, what am I apologizing for? You are sympathetic that I'm grieving. Sure. It's different than, than an apology. An apology is if I knock over your bag, and I say, fine, I'm sorry, I knocked over your bag, I feel bad about that, right? I did it, right? I, I don't mind getting this up. <coughs> There is a video, and we can play it for you. There's a video that was played where Alex Jones says, I am sincerely, I have sincere condolences to the, to the families of Sandy Hook. Are you familiar with that? Is this the same video that you had <coughs> asked me about? Same one, right. I'm just trying to figure out if you're familiar with this one particular video. It aired um, exactly, I think it was exactly one week before, not after, before this video was played. You understand that? I'm not familiar with the exact video you're talking about. Okay. Well, it's DX67. We're not going to play it. But it was before this. Okay? Take my word for that? Sure. Will you play the fact checkers clip? This is still part of the saying. I'll just... Basically, what he said, the statement he made... Fact checkers on this have said cannot be accurate. Who are the fact checkers? I'm not sure. I'm looking over this right now. It may have been that text may have been in the story that phrase fact checkers. Really? But um, Mr. Troy, we got time. <clears throat> the article is not long. If you want to read it and find out, I'm happy for you, or I can point you to where I think you want to look. Okay, would you? Yeah, if you look at page two, can you put this up, Melissa? This is a PX20. Is your water filter empty? Yes. Ms. Magic Steel, can you bring another water pitcher out, please? Defense table. Page two, Melissa. Take this one if you'd like. This one's good. Let my staff handle it. Can you go up the bottom? See any of the word. You see at the bottom of page two of the story, it says Jim Fetzer, professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota, who wrote a book claiming Sandy Hook was staged, and goes on to kind of spew whatever that is. 
That's the fact checker, right? Um, that's most likely what I was referring to, yes. Okay. Fire from Minnesota for his stuff on Sandy Hook wedding. You know that? Um, I did not know that at the time. Um, I do understand that he no longer is employed at that university. The book, Sandy Hook, what this, I'm sorry, this book's not called Sandy Hook on Stage, it's called Nobody Died in Sandy Hook. You, you know that, right? No, I'm unfamiliar. Was it on, wasn't it on the InfoWars website as a PDF? I'm not sure. Thank you. So, so, so oh, Mr. Orient, okay. Orient the jury, this is June 25th, 2017, we ran for right? Yes. Okay. Lucy, you put up uh, PX73. You blow up the whole email for good. You know who Paul Watson is, right? Yes. Remember what his title was in 2015 or 2016? What do you mean by title? What was his job? He worked for InfoWars. What was, he, what was his job? I believe he was the editor in chief. Okay. Let's see what he says in an email on December 17, 2015. So about six months before you run that story. I'm going to read this along and see if I read it right. This Sandy book stuff is killing us. It's promoted by the most batshit crazy people like Rince and Fetzer, who all hate us anyway. Plus, it makes us look really bad to align with people who harass the parents of dead kids. It's going to hurt us with Drudge and bringing bigger names into the show. Plus, the event happened three years ago. Why even risk our reputation for it? I read that right? Yes. And you see a copy that said, send this to Alex, right? Yes. You understand that to me? This is the message he sent to Alex, and he's now sending it to Buckley, uh, Anthony, and Anthony at InfoWars, right? Yes. Six months before you ran your story, InfoWars knew that Fetzer was not a well man, right? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Six months before you ran your story, who the fact checker in the story was Fetzer. Six months before you did that, InfoWars knew that he was not a well man, right? Your Honor. <clears throat> oh, I looked at it wrong, my bad. So, I'm sorry. Uh, a year and a half, my, my fault, not six months, a year and a half before, a year and a half before you ran your story, <coughs> InfoWars knew that Spencer was not well, right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, clearly, via this email, Paul Joseph Watson did not trust Spencer and called him that shit crazy. And there was a there was an email that went out that said, stop this, let's stop for this interview stuff, right? Yes. But you didn't. Right? I never saw this email. I didn't say you saw this email. You clearly saw the one that said stop working at San Diego stuff, right? No, I just told you I've never seen this email. Not this email. Was there a message, email, smoke signal, memo, whatever it may be, that said stop it at InfoWars with the San Diego stuff? Uh, I believe those memos may have gone around. I don't exactly recall, though. That didn't happen, though. There was more videos, and then there was yours in 2017, right? Yes. Can you play the Carver video? So before you play it, this is the clip from Dr. Carver, the, the medical examiner. And, and you can hear his answer well. I'm going to turn this as loud as I can. I want you to try to hear the question that he's answering. Okay? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered it? Uh, I'm not sure. You don't know if you've ever heard the question that he's actually answering? I'm, I, I don't recall. It's not for me. I mean, okay. it is for uh, me, but it's for it. the record, too. Right. So this is so this your is video, plaintiff's video 23. Yes, PBX, PBX 23. And it's <laughs> loud. Okay. It's going to be prepared. Turn, turn it down right after the question. We may have listened to it a few times. I'll tell you what, I'm actually going to tell you what the question is, and then you can just, it, it'll help you hear when you actually know what it is. The question is, what shape were the bodies in when the families were brought forward to identify them? Okay. Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them, uh, of, of their families. 
facial features. You have uh, uh, it's it's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, there is uh, a time and a place for up close and personal in the grieving process. But to accomplish this, uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way. And uh, you can sort of uh, you can control the situation. Uh, depending on your photographer, and I have very good photographers, uh, but, uh... Does it sound like the question that I said? Uh, it sounded like it. Okay, it's close. It's something about how were these children's bodies, what condition were they in when the poor family had to come identify? That was the question being asked, right? It's tough to hear, but it's something like that. All right. Do you think the state of Connecticut just somehow wouldn't allow parents to ever be reunited with their kids after they were murdered? Is that a real thought you have? I'm, I'm not sure. Do you think that's possible? What's possible? That the state of Connecticut just wouldn't give the bodies of, of murdered children back to their parents for the mourning and grieving process? I'm not sure the process of uh, coroners receiving and retrieving dead bodies and the process of that getting released. All I had was that clip. And in the clip, what Dr. Carver says is to accomplish this. What is the this he's talking about? I'm not sure. It's the identification of the kids and matching them up with the parents, right? Okay. Do you think it would be wise to have a board full of 20 dead first graders and bring parents in and say, go find your child? Or is it a little bit better practice to have photographs and try to do it that way? I have no idea. I've never worked with a coroner. I don't know that process. Which one makes more sense, Mr. Schroyer? Again, I don't know. Maybe it's harder to identify with a picture. Maybe it's harder to identify a body. You're asking me a line of work I have zero experience in. You never listen to the whole video, the whole interview. Dr. Carver, right? I don't believe so. Um, if you look at tab six in your book. Tab six? Yes, sir. Oh, you may not have it. Uh, I, my book goes up to four. I'm not going to introduce this. I'm going to just show it to you to help to see <coughs> more or something. Thank you. I have the whole video. I don't think we need to listen to it. But what I did is just a screenshot it and blew up the uh, little stamp at the end. It shows 1528. You see that? Yes. Does that help show you that this the whole video is 15 minutes and 28 seconds? I'll trust your word for it. All right. Can I just screw up as a demonstrative? Connor? Any objection? No objection. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. You edited out what? In your piece, there was a part edited out of what, maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds? Something around there, yes. You can take it down, listen. That was available, right? You could have went and found that video, figured out what, what was being discussed, right? You mean, at when do you mean? When you heard it. No. You don't think that video is available when you aired it? You know, available. It might have been available. But I'm saying I never had access to it, and I had four minutes left until break, and that was all the videos I had. Four minutes left until the, <coughs> the ion, metal ion, whatever feels? Yeah, the break. Right. The commercial. The infomercial. The commercial break, yeah. Right. Infomercial break. You testified that, that this was available. It was on. It was... You could have found it if you went looking for it, right? You're not disputing that. The full um, interview of the coroner was available. Okay. You're agreeing with me, right? Well, again, I, I don't know that, but I'm, tra I'm taking your word for it. Okay. Well, if you could, look at your deposition on page 110, line 14. question that you're asked is, because available was the whole coroner's press conference. True? What's your answer? Where's this? Uh, 110, line 14 through 16. I'll read my question again. 
because available was the whole coroner's press conference. True? My answer was not to me, but it was out there. It was available if somebody just looked, right? Uh, yes. Your whole story. This whole story is wrong because you didn't know the clip from the interview with the coroner was edited. That's fair, right? Yeah, the zero head story, I had that clipped out. Let me ask you that question again, and I'm not responsible. Sustained. The whole story you ran, the free speech system put out on the air to however many people would watch it, and then probably loaded it up somewhere. That whole story was wrong because you did not know the clip from the interview of the coroner was edited, right? I, I don't understand your question, I'm sorry. What you aired is wrong. It's wrong, right? It's not a correct statement. The whole piece is wrong. Can you be more specific for me? Yeah, this timeline of events and fact checkers is all wrong. Not true. Factually inaccurate. Fair? Yeah, I'd say that it's my recollection that the timeline presented in that story was inaccurate now. And the story was wrong because you didn't know that that interview with the coroner was edited, right? Correct. Okay. You were just, like you said a second ago, too much of a, too, in too much of a hurry to get that on the air, to do that, right? No, it wasn't a hurry. It was just a new story was brought to me, and I covered it. And in the process, hurt real people. You understand that now, right? I, I feel awful for feeding parents from that horrific event. That is not what I asked you. In the process of hurrying up and putting that story out to a, a worldwide broadcast, you hurt real people. Do you understand that sitting here right now today? I'm sorry if that hurt anybody. It's hard for me to accept that as we're continuing to talk about it, for me to say, understand this hurts someone, but yet we just keep talking about it, so we're just going to keep hurting people. You think they shouldn't exercise their rights to the court system, because that might hurt them just let you off. That's what you think? No. You said that? I'm very upset that this continues, and I hope that their grieving can end sometime. If, the word if in there, didn't you? Well, I would imagine going through this process has to still hurt. You signed an affidavit in this case. Do you remember that? Yes. You pull up kicks, fortune. And before you do, Your Honor, I believe it is evidence that I want to confirm. I could give you the number. PX 14, sorry. 14 is in evidence. It's tab 2 in your book. Let's see pull up to the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No. You asked me about y'all's number and system, not a video. Let okay, me double check. I looked at the wrong thing. Okay, 14 is in evidence. Thank yes. You. Got it. If you look a couple pages in where your signature line is, says sworn to yes. well, let me just ask you an easier way you know when you do an affidavit that's sworn testimony right yes okay. under penalty person right I want to look at paragraph 10 please so page one page four you're discussing the broadcast and what you did. And you say, I then played the referenced unaltered widely distributed video clip of a news conference with the medical examiner 
cited when she told reporters that parents were not given access to their children. Unaltered? Yes. That is inaccurate. No, there's right? nothing altered about that clip. I just showed you the clip's 15 minutes and change, right? That's a different clip. Okay. What you're saying is you just you just took whatever zero point now did and did whatever he wanted to do, right? I'm saying that the clip that you played at the corner was not altered. It may have been cut out of a larger clip, but that clip itself was not altered. At least I'm not aware of it. If I take a clip and take a piece out of it, haven't I altered the clip? No, you just right. made a new clip. Okay, so by unaltered, what you mean is you didn't like dub over it or something like that? Yes. Okay. All right. Take that down with you. I want to play one more, well, actually a couple more parts from PBX 23. 23. Um, we're going to play that McDonald family clip, if you would. It's got to be, you know, I'm not to have been able to actually see her. Well, at first I thought that, and I had questioned maybe wanting to see her. Early on, I asked you the question, it is not right to edit a clip to fit an agenda. You agree, right? Yes. You know that clip was edited to fit an agenda, right? Not at the time. I didn't ask you that at the time. Today, I still don't know that. You don't? Okay. You've never seen the full transcript? No. Okay. Famous Exhibit 19 is under tab 3. This is the transcript of the whole article with um, Anderson Cooper. Now we'd uh, move plans to do it 19 and the other. Any objection? Authentication, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, come from the CNN, CNN website. Um, we're obviously not offering the truth of the matter, sir. Obviously, but um, we're just showing him that he edited a clip. Right, so he, he has objection is authentic authentication, not hearsay. Okay. So do you have something to show me where it came from? I don't believe it with her effort. Okay. Right, can I read the rest of that answer? Or have read the rest of the answer to that question now? The, who read the rest of the answer to what question? I'm sorry. The, uh, Ms. McDonald's answer that was cut off from the clip that he played, we have the rest of the answer. That do you have the video? You only have a transcript. We're unable to ever find the video. And, okay. And you got the transcript from the CNN website? Our expert, our expert did. Okay. If we need to wait for him, right? I think we might need to wait for the expert That's right. and then bring it back up. Sure. Mr. Schroyer, have you seen the full video? No, ma'am. Do you, Mr. Schroyer, understand that what she was saying about seeing her child was in the funeral home? That the McDonald family, what they did is they brought Grace's things that she loves, seashells, um, they brought sunglasses, they brought a Taylor Swift album, a Christmas album that she loved, a frying pan that she loved to cook. And they were going to put it in the casket with Grace. But they didn't because they didn't want to see her body like that, so they gave it to the funeral director to do. You understand that's what she's saying right there? I was unaware of that. That would be an important thing to know, right? Before you run a piece like that? Yes. Obviously she saw her child, right? I, I don't know. Obviously, she was allowed. That's a bad question. Obviously, she was allowed to see my children, right? I don't know. It, it is your position that you do not know, as a as a general proposition, whether or not parents of murdered children are ever allowed to see the child's body. I'd have to make an assumption, but I mean, I would assume yes. Right. the ending clip. The ending clip. One more clip from PDX 23. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook. The conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that 
have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event. That's just a fact. So there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. Why in the world would Neil Heslin owe you an explanation? He doesn't. Why in the world would Megyn Kelly owe you an explanation? She doesn't. What about any of that was funny? As I explained earlier, if Megan's, Megyn Kelly's goal was to stymie conspiracy theories about Sandy Hook being a hoax, it did the exact opposite of its effect. You know, I don't find funny. Sandy Hook funny. I don't find the tragic loss of life funny at all. Do you think, do you think that prolonged and increased grief around a, a, a murdered child or something? Because that's no. what happened. Right? You understand? That's what happened. prolonged and you compounded grief. You understand that? By covering an interview with Megyn Kelly? By saying Neil Heslin never held Jesse after never the murder of Sandy Hook Elementary School. I never That's said that. that. Did Scarlett and Neil deserve better than what you did that day? Yes. In 2016 is when you started at Infowars for Free Speech Systems. Um, you knew and know that really the only people that were spreading this lie about Sandy Hook was you and Wolfgang Holland, right? No. Turn to page 191 for your deposition. The question is, why were they so? Why were they so important to you in this video? You mentioned them twice, and you answered. I think it was more a matter of, from my perspective, Alex Jones was catching all this flack for Sandy Hook, but the other people that were questioning it weren't. To my best knowledge, the question: Well, what do you mean by other people? Answer: Wolfgang Holliday. Question: Anyone else? Answer: Not that I'm aware of. That's what you said under oath, what, a, eight months ago, right? Yes. Have you learned something different now? Uh, can you rephrase that? Have you learned something different? I mean, the people spreading the lies about Sandy Hook was Alex Jones and Wolfgang Holliday. Those are the two main people, right? Well, I guess Zero Hedge as well. With his three shares? Well, that was at the time. I don't know how many times it's been shared now. So, I just want to, I want to make, make sure you got, what is it, zero point? Or zero, or zero edge? Or something. The author? I, I, I said zero edge. Zero edge, okay. Wolfgang Holbeck and Alex Jones and Influence, right? Right one. Is that, those are the folks that were spreading lies about San Diego. I feel like you're asking a separate question. You, let me go back to the deposition. I'll ask you a different question. You say in your deposition on page 191 that the other people catching flack about Sandy Hook was Wolfgang Holbeck and you're not aware of anyone else, correct? That's what you said under oath. No, I said Alex Jones. Alex Jones and Wolfgang Holbeck. Those are the two, right? Those are the two names mentioned in my deposition, yes. And, and it wasn't like we just moved on. There was another question that said, anyone else? And you said, not that I'm aware of, right? Yes. Okay. But today, you want to say zero hedge. We'll throw them in the mix. Zero enough. hedge, zero point now, and I guess I bank point too. Yeah. All right. You would agree with me that to spread, whether it be the truth or a lie, you have to have a way to reach the audience, right? Okay, yes. A platform, if you will. Yes. Wolfgang Holbeck, InfoWars was his voice. Oh, you were his megaphone, right? No. He didn't have a TV show, right? 
you don't need a TV show to have a voice. I'm going to go through some other items too. So I'll ask that question again. He doesn't have a TV show, right? Not that I'm aware of. He doesn't have a radio show, right? Not that I'm aware of. He doesn't have some big internet presence, right? I don't know. He doesn't have any way to get his brand of crazy out other through other than through InfoWorks, right? That's who he used, right? I don't know. Let's play PBX 15G. <coughs> You have no reason to be doing this to be going public. I mean, I would imagine you've lost a lot of business. And you tell that to my wife. I am about to kick out of my own house after being married 39 years. Alex, I'm about to lose my family because I'm simply asking the questions that you and your stations are looking at. And I'm asking you right now, and I'm asking all your listeners, don't go it. Support InfoWars. Become part of the Warriors. We need out. We need this show. We need the truth. Uh, if you find it in your heart to donate a few dollars to our legal funds, let me tell you, we have them. We have the lawsuits filed. We are closed, but we can't do it without people helping me. I'm too old for this, but I do need help. But big thing is support InfoWars, because if we don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth. Well, folks, you need to donate, and, and bring it as you're going to break. Tell us the specifics of where it was filed, what's going on with the lawsuit. Well, it's filed here in Seminole County because all my businesses, Children's Safety Institute, the National Institute, this is my home, this is where I live. And so instead of going to Connecticut where everything is crooked, we're going to come in the back door and therefore we file it. It's in the Seminole County court system. The judge, I mean the female judge, she saw what we're talking about and she did not hesitate issuing those 10 subpoenas across the country. And they've been served, and we're not just waiting for all of the responses. Wow, well, this is big national news. Did you hear Mr. Halbig say, if we don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth? I don't remember everything he said, but I believe something along those lines was said yesterday. You trust me that that's close enough, right? That's, that was the message he just said. Rather than play it again, I'll trust you. Fair enough. The your in your voice is InfoWars or Alex Jones, right? Uh, or, or, or the audience, yeah. The audience. We're going to play it again and I'm going to stop it right after he says it so I don't listen to it all. Okay? Let's make sure. Thank you. You have no reason to be doing this to be going public. I mean, I would imagine you've lost a lot of business. And you tell that to my wife. I am about to be kicked out of my own house after being married 39 years. Alex, I'm about to lose my family because I'm simply asking the questions that you and your stations are looking at. And I'm asking you right now, and I'm asking all your listeners, don't go in, support InfoWars, become part of the Warriors. We need out, we need this show, we need the truth. Uh, if you find it in your heart to donate a few dollars to our legal funds, let me tell you, we have them. We have the lawsuits filed. We are closed, but we can't do it without people helping me. I'm too old for this, but I do need help. But big thing is support InfoWars, because if we don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth. Support InfoWars, because if we don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth. Mr. Halbig knows he needs InfoWars to get his message out, right? I don't know that. That's what he just said. Not necessarily. Tell me what other interpretation that we all just heard of we need InfoWars. If we don't have, I mean, right, say it perfectly, if we don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth. What other interpretation is it that he needs InfoWars to get his message out? He addressed before that. He said, I said something along the lines of, I need your listeners, or I need all your listeners. So that could be viewed as, we're all in this together. We need your voice, like you out there in the audience. Support InfoWars. This is right before it, right? Support InfoWars. We don't have your voice, nobody's going to hear the truth. Right? Yeah. Support InfoWars by giving money, right? Uh, yeah, and I think he mentioned a legal fund campaign, too. Yeah, so, because in addition to selling supplements, I mean, that's what he's saying, support InfoWars, he's not saying go buy the supplements. He's saying just give you money, right? 
No. If you have a donate button, just donate money, right? We do have a donate button, yeah, but I don't think you mentioned that. I didn't hear that. Right. And, and sometimes you have almost telephones where it's just, just, just give me money. If you want to hear the truth, if you want to hear the truth, just give us money. Give us some more money, right? Yeah, everybody does that. PBS, everybody does that. Is that does PBS sell brain force? What is it, brain force to No, they just take our money. Yeah. Without the, without the brain force to bills? That, that's the bill, right? Uh, brain force plus is a bill. Yes. Brain force plus. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, PBS doesn't have to sell anything to get funding. They just get it for free. You know, PBS is a nonprofit, right? Nonprofit? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you not know that? Well, it might be a nonprofit, but people are getting paid. Yeah, that's how nonprofits work. Mr. Schroeder, I don't have more questions for you. All right, Mr. Reno. When I wasn't starting on the varsity teams, I realized I was not going to be a professional <coughs> athlete, so I began writing for our school newspaper and doing reporting from our high school sporting events. While you were, after you graduated from <coughs> high school, while you were in college, did you continue to work in broadcast? I did. When I was at college, I was actually working professionally at multiple radio stations in St. Louis. And I was also the editor-in-chief of our student newspaper called The Current. And uh, what type of reporting were you doing? For The Current, I was reporting on everything because we were very understaffed. So movies, concerts, sports, uh, just general activities on campus. And then professionally, I was in the sports media covering <coughs> local sports in St. Louis, college, professional. Uh, was this on the radio? Yes. And about how much time would you spend on the radio talking about sports? At one point in time, I was producing, I believe, four shows a day, weekdays. And I was not the host, um, but I would engage in mm -hmm. commentary with the show hosts that I was producing for at that time. <coughs> Did so we're talking maybe 10, 12 hours. And um, did you, uh, did there come a time when you became interested in covering things beyond just sports? Yeah, I believe it was about 2013 when I wanted to pivot from sports to current events and politics. And if you recall, what, was there an event, something that happened that, that made you want to switch from sports to current events and politics? There was. It was the Boston Marathon bombing. It was the first time in my life that I ever watched a news broadcast at all. I was not really watching television news, but I had the same fervor for being accurate talking on the radio back then, so I started to watch news reports on the Boston Marathon bombing, and I started to follow up on some of those, do some digging, and what I realized was that we're not getting a full story from our government or our mainstream media. And it was kind of a shocking experience for me that really just changed my career path. How did you go about making the transition from, and let me back up, what was it about the coverage of the Boston Marathon bombing that so stuck out to you and made you want to look into it more? Well, for one, the FBI put up the Sarnia brothers' mugshots 
and they were looking for information on them. But they claimed at the time they didn't know who they were, and it later came out that the older Sonia brother was actually a government asset and had been flying back and forth from the United States to parts of the Middle East. So they knew well, they were well aware of who he was, and they didn't tell us that. And then when I saw the lockdown that they had, I don't know if lockdown is the right word, but basically they were going door to door looking for them, and then somehow he's in a boat covered in blood and they didn't find him. So I didn't really know what I was getting into at the time. I just had more interest in that in that moment than I did in sports for the first time in my life. And how did you how did you go about making the transition from being a sports only radio person to being somebody who covered politics and current events? I was extremely embedded in the sports industry in St. Louis, so it really wasn't even a transition. I continued to work all the jobs that I had in sports, but I started doing some political stuff on the side, doing some YouTube live videos, starting to interject some political stuff on the radio shows. Um, so it was really just more of an add on top than it was a transition at the time. Your, uh, the, When you were five, when you got a radio show that allowed you to talk about politics and current events, um, how old? I think I was 23 at the time, and really most of my political coverage at that time was on YouTube, because anybody could start a YouTube account and fire up a live stream and have an audience. And. From what time to what time did it broadcast? There was no uh, frequency of time. It was really just a matter of if I had a free hour or so. That was a poor question. When you finally got a radio show and said he was talking about politics and current events, what time was it aired? Nine to midnight. And um, were you paid to do that? No. How did you get the radio station to put you on from nine to midnight? Well. I won a civil suit against the radio station because they owed me thousands of dollars. And the GM at the time offered me a time slot on the radio in exchange for not me not being paid the funds. I knew I wasn't going to get paid. I wanted the airtime. So that was the deal that was made. All right, it's 5 o'clock. We're going to break for the day. For my jury, please remember and follow all of the instructions I've given you so far, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8.45 so that we can start right at 9. Thank you so much. I didn't actually hear any of that from Mr. Ball, so that's not their portrayal. Uh, I heard some testimony from Ms. Lewis about how she feels about it. Uh, again, I don't think that constitutes a portrayal. Um, I think, do you have, let me put it this way. I believe that Mr. Bankston is correct in how he describes the rule of optional completeness. Do you have an argument to make for why whatever portion of this video you think needs to be played is required for the jury to not be confused by the portion they heard um, earlier today? It's the argument I already made. Though. And Your Honor, I would just reply to that, that the idea that he's saying that they're not, like he wants to play it so he can show that Mr. Jones believes that they're real, literally said that in the video that we just played. So shows how is real. Right, I, I did hear that as well. Um, also, the claim that he's been sitting next to them all week, I heard that also. Um, I have a hard time imagining, and I have not watched it, um, that any clip that includes a conversation about what's happening in court this week can be in any way helpful to the jury in their job. Um, I've certainly, can you please sit down, Mr. Jones? It is not your turn to talk. I will happily allow Mr. Raynal a minute to hear all of your suggestions uh, if you and he think that is necessary, but you have to wait. Um, I haven't watched any of it, so I don't know what it says. If you want to send it to me and have me watch it um, on a break, 
I will do that. But um, there are a number of people who have been writing to me and telling me what Mr. Jones is saying every day. I don't know if they're accurate or not in their descriptions. I'm not otherwise going to find out. So I will only see this if you send it to me and ask me to look at it. Would you like to confer with your client? I think he wants you to say something else. We'd simply re-urge that um, it's confusing for the jury because the clip leaves out the part where Mr. Jones says that he certainly believes that Ms. Lewis is real. All right, so if you want to send me that part, that may in fact meet the requirements of uh, the rule of optional completeness, and uh, send it to my uh, staff attorney, and she'll review it, and then I'll review it on a break, and I'll let you know. Thank you. Anything else before we bring the jury back? No, you don't. Anything from your side? All right. We're ready to have the jury back. I'll be seated. Mr. Reynal, do you have a witness for the jury? I do. The defense would call Alex E. Jones. All right, Mr. Jones, come stand in front of me, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Come have a seat. Um, in the witness chair, there is water and glasses. You have pretty good volume. I don't think you'll need to lean into the microphone. I see that you have a document with you. I don't know if you were here when I explained to a prior witness who brought documents with them that you can't look at any document for any reason while you're testifying until and unless one of the lawyers or myself instructs you to do so. So I'm going to ask you to actually just give it back to Mr. Raynal until he may think you need it, okay? Okay. Did you understand all that? I did, yes. Okay. While you testify, it is not a conversation. It is a question and answer. So the instructions are to let the lawyers completely finish asking their questions before you begin your answer, to listen to the question and answer what is asked. So you can't always say that you don't know or you don't understand if those things are true. To answer out loud in words and not head shakes and the like. Um, I think that, that's all my instructions. I say it so many times, sometimes I forget one thing, but I think those are all, do you understand them? I do. All right, you may begin, Mr. Reynal. Alex, would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Hi, I'm Alex Jones. How are you feeling today, Alex? I actually feel good because I get a chance to, for the first time, say what's really going on instead of the corporate media and high-powered law firms manipulating what I actually did. I want to um, start by kind of letting the jury know a little bit about your youth and where you grew up so they can get to know you better. Is that okay? Okay. And, and you know, before we do that, I just do want to say this on record because I've said it many times. I apologize. 
to both. Uh, sustained. So, Mr. Jones, one of the instructions I just gave you is that this is not a conversation. Question and answer. So she got the monologue without me. I got it. And so you have to only answer questions that are asked of you. Mr. Reynal will ask you, I'm certain, all the questions you want, but you have to wait for the question. You may proceed. Mr. Jones, have you been wanting to uh, apologize to the plaintiffs in this case for a long time? Yes. And what would you like to say to them? That I never intentionally tried to hurt you. I never even said your name until this case came to court. Uh, I didn't even really know who you were until a couple years ago when all this started up. The internet had a lot of questions. I had questions. And over that six, seven year period before I got sued, or six year period, it, it's clear, you can see the whole progression of us, the few times we covered it, trying to actually find out what happened. And that's really been my big frustration, is that the people have said that I'm personally trying to hurt them or coming after them. When I question every big event, and a lot of times it turns out that we've not been uh, told the truth. And a perfect example, is today where they play a 30 or a one minute clip and I had just done that this morning and I knew that I said I believe that Scarlett Lewis is real and she's a really you know, nice person and she's really a sweet person and then I went through and talked about her ex-husband too and then, the, then I said I believe they're being fed and manipulated and this is a perfect sustained this is a perfect sustained. Mm -hmm. when you hear sustained you have to stop okay. talking okay. Do you feel that the video clip was a fair representation of what uh, what you meant to convey? No, it had the front and back, no. Okay, and why wasn't it fair? Because it had the front and back cut off of it to totally misrepresent the apology at the end and at the first where I said, I believe she's a real person and lost her child. So someone edited that and then showed it to her and then they brought it in here and played it to show it to you, and I think you should ask to see the full segment. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, I want to ask you some questions about where you grew up and how you came to have your business. Can you let us know where where are you from in Texas originally? I first was born in Dallas, then I grew up in a suburb of Dallas called Rockwell. And how old were you when you moved to Austin? Sixteen. And can you tell the members of the jury why your family relocated to Austin? My dad sold his dental practice, and there was a, too much crime in Dallas, and Austin was a safer city. Were you still in high school when you moved here? Yes. And did you graduate from high school? Yes. Here in Austin? Yes. And um, did you go to college? No. Well, I mean, I went a few years of community college. Are you married? Yes. How many children do you have? I have four. Can you tell us their names and their ages? I've got to. Uh, I need to say their names. Well, you, do, you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, well, there's their the, ages. Sure. The, there's there's Rex, who's 19, Charlotte, who's 18, Georgia, who's 14, and Veronica, who's 5. And is your wife present in the courtroom today? She is. She's right there. Okay. And what's her name? Erica. I want to ask you some questions about how you got started up in, in media with your radio show. Okay. How old were you when you first uh, felt that you wanted to be on the air, that you wanted to, to work in media? When I was about 17, I really liked listening to talk radio. And I'd grown up with my dad on road trips listening to like Larry King when he was still on radio. And I really liked Larry King on radio and then also on CNN. And I also liked Howard Stern, I thought he was funny. And I really wanted to be a talk show host. And how did you take that desire to be a talk show host and, and those early influences, how did you translate that into action? How did you first get on the air? I had been out of high school about a year and a half, two years, and I went down and took classes at the Access TV station here in Austin, one of the first places ever have Access TV, had one of the best systems. So they had. Uh, a lot of equipment and a lot of studio space. A lot of it was old and equipment, but was still very useful. So I became self-taught uh, with that equipment and 
in about 94, 95, and then 95 started doing uh, my own little call-in shows, and then those became pretty popular uh, quickly. And so the phone rang, and a, and a DJ by the name of Sharkman, who had a national show that was managing the local station, 98.9, said, I think you should come in and do like a three-hour radio show this Saturday and see what people think. And they had Howard Stern on their station. They had G. Ward Lady, a bunch of other big hosts. They had some other big local hosts who couldn't like the phone lines up. And the first time I went in, they got about 100 calls the first night. How old were you? I was, uh, I think I was 21, 22 by then. And what was the format of your early shows on Austin Public Access TV? It wasn't as conspiratorial or political. There was some of that because there was other people doing those shows, and I already knew about that information. Uh, but it was just all over the map. It was just really calling shows on different topics. Did variety shows like Carter Pumpkins on TV on Halloween, and you know have a guy come in with his pet monkey and it you know dances around. Just fun stuff. Because I also liked uh, Johnny Carson growing up. Did people like your show? They did. And did you uh, did your did your show? I mean, it sounds sort of like a almost like a Wayne's World kind of thing. Uh, I think Wayne's World's a good way to describe it. And did it uh, did it win any accolades? It did. It, it, it won Best of Austin a few times in the newspaper, and pretty much started getting written about, and even national coverage in about two years. Really? And so, tell us in those you told us already about Larry King and about Howard Stern. Who would you say influenced you artistically in the format and, and how you, you did your show uh, then and became the, the man you are today? I mean, really, I, I, I listen to Larry King a lot because my dad listened to him on the radio um, a lot when I was so, from the time I was like six, seven, I remember listening to Larry King. And then I'd watch him a lot of nights at home in junior high and high school. So I would, I would say more than anybody, Larry King. And did there come a time when, because of your success and having uh, won this uh, Listener's Choice Award or Viewer's Choice Award, that uh, you were able to be syndicated? Well, I won a couple of those. I don't think the syndication folks were even paying attention to that. I, I built a studio in a bedroom in my house because they wouldn't put the equipment in at the local station where I had you know, top ratings um, to syndicate it. And so I went home, got the equipment, had an engineer come set it up and then called a syndication outfit and um, got a sponsor and then I paid to put it on the satellite. And then I got about probably 60, 70 affiliates in about a month and then it went up to several hundred affiliates after that. Can you describe for us what the setup was like? Was it in a spare bedroom? It was. And what kind of furniture was in there? It was a simple wooden desk and a microphone and a little mixer and then a, a chair if I had a guest. And what is syndication for, for those of us that don't know? Instead of being on one station, it goes up at that time to a satellite. Now a lot of it's over the internet. And then it's beamed back down. And then other stations can pick it up. And so you said you were syndicated on how many uh, radio stations? It fluctuated between 30 or 40 at first and as much as over 200. I would say things that were politically not popular to talk radio, more left-wing things like being anti-war or, or things like that, and I would lose a bunch of stations, and I would gain more stations, but talk radio was mainly conservative. And so when 9-11 came around and I had questions, we lost 70% uh, of our affiliates in one month because I didn't want to uh, you know, attack all these foreign countries, but I still was steadfast and had that message so that I got real popular with the left-wing but I wasn't trying to be left wing, I was trying to follow the right thing, even though it made me lose most of my radio stations, which is the issue of how I do what I think's right. Sometimes I'm wrong, I've been more right than wrong, but I do, don't do it for the monetary thing. I do it to tell the truth, and, or to try to tell the truth, and then the monetary comes with that because people can tell this guy's not reading off the script, uh, and with that comes its own issues. Uh, but I'm not lying like the corporate media on purpose, that's the big difference. And so let's focus in on this 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 early period. What year did you get syndicated? I syndicated myself in 1998. And at that time, did you already have the the show name, the Info War? Yes. What no, no, it, it it wasn't ever called Info Wars. It was just the Alex Jones show. Because you have to call the show your name. 
because that's how they do it with the ratings that were written in on little diaries. So to be on radio, you had to say the name of the show coming in and out. It was like TV for Nielsen ratings, so it was the Alex Jones show. Tell us about InfoWars. How did uh, the name InfoWars come to be, and how did that business start? Vic Freeland, who was an Air Force veteran, who worked in Air Force Intelligence in Vietnam, he was the deputy fire chief in Austin, and he was a listener, and he'd done some talk radio interviews, he'd been on some syndicated shows, because of magazine articles he'd written, and he came to some of the events, and he said, listen, you know, you're really involved in an information war, that's that, and and because all information is propaganda, whether it's true or not, it's called information war, and so you ought to try to get that URL. And he had a big old laptop. He said, "Look, it's available. Do you want Infowars.com?" And so Vic Freeland got the site. He then, even in his spare time, because he was still working with the fire department then, he uh, built the basic site and stuff. Then helped find me a. a volunteer or whatever at first, we didn't really have any money, to then start updating the site a little bit every day, and that was in 1997. So, so, so InfoWars came from an Air Force intelligence term. So, at the, you had the Alex Jones show that was being uh, broadcast, and you also had InfoWars at the same time. Yes, I had a radio show. At the time, I was doing a local radio show, and then I was doing the, the, the syndicated one out of my house, and then I had a website that I could post articles on or links to to say, look, this is on the site, go check it out on air. So it's kind of a way to make radio almost like TV because the internet was starting to become more effective and, and, and more, where it actually worked, where it's not effective, where you could actually post stuff and do things. And so we could put things on there and show people what we were talking about. Did you also start making, uh, in order to support InfoWars, did you also start making uh, documentaries? I did start making documentaries in 1997. I made my first documentary, America Destroyed by Design, about the Great Reset that was coming and the different UN documents that were in it. And then I made more than 25 more films after that. Why, um, why make the films? Most talk show hosts would sell a coffee cup or a newsletter to fund themselves, and I wanted to build a larger news organization because I wanted to do more and I wanted to make documentaries so I went out and made documentaries and used the money from that to make more documentaries because that way you could show people what it was you were talking about in a, in a format before there was really the internet because even though the internet was around it was mainly text and pictures in 96, 90, you know, 7, 8, 9 documentaries on VHS and the DVD was uh, you know the way people interface with that. And at the time, what was your main topic of interest that you wanted to explore through your documentaries as well as through your radio show and your website? The plan to cut off U.S. energy reserves that we're now experiencing, the plan to cut off uh, all coal power generation, then gas, and uh, the uh, forced move on to renewables, but that it was in the documents, they didn't plan to even have those. It was a post-industrial uh, program called Agenda 21 that George Herbert Walker Bush signed on to in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. And I read the plan, and it said we're building a post-industrial world. And we're going to have the controlled demolition of civilization to force depopulation. And, and now that's mainline news. Bill Maher called for depopulation last Friday night. In addition to your documentaries, uh, are you also an author? I am, yes. How many books have you written? I've written two and contributed to more than 20. We'll talk about your, your latest book later. Um, let's move forward a little bit. At, in 2001, um, what, if anything, happened with you and, uh, and your program at YouTube? Say that again, please. Did you have a, a, a series of videos that were very successful on YouTube in the early 2000s? Before YouTube came around in, I think, 2004, and then it was out of some guy's garage in San Francisco that bought by Google around that time, we were actually putting out videos ourselves 
that we were streaming ourselves, but it became too expensive, so we had to stop. We were doing that by, by, by 2000, 2001. And, I mean, these are all the technical things, but then Google Video came around, and we had, we had videos on there with, with you know, millions of people that watched them, and we were just putting them out for free. And it was, um, it was very popular with the left, because it was us tracking and, and, and protesting the KKK. It was us exposing police brutality uh, and things like that. And I wasn't trying to be left wing, I just thought those were really important topics. And so I got really popular with the left wing then. And they went and had me speak in San Francisco and New York, and I got big awards, you know, by the big uh, liberal Democrat channels. Let me ask you about, about that part, because that's an, an aspect of, of your work and, and who you are that you cultivate, which is different from in the studio. Um, from the very beginning, did you believe it was important to go to demonstrations, to talk to the people on the street, to be part of protests? Absolutely. And how did that play into what you were trying to do at InfoWars? Well, InfoWars is a radio show on TV. And that's really what Oprah Winfrey is too. It's just, a, it, but, but, but I mean, that's, it all goes back to radio when that started 100 years ago, or a little bit more now. And so, that's a separate thing. A talk show with opinions and people debating is like The View. They're not fact checking, they're just giving their opinions. When I'm on the radio show, most of the time I'm just a pundit giving my opinion. Everybody on talk radio knows that. We play devil's advocates, we look at both sides. I don't do that very often now because people can edit tapes and hurt you bad. And I would say, well, let's look at this. They're saying this, and they believe that, and now let's look at this. Uh, and as later as I realized my show had a lot more power than I thought, I realized, well, even if I'm not the one editing these tapes, I've got to be more careful because there's bad guys out there that, uh, that will do it. But the films I'm proud of, we didn't ever put any films out about Sandy Hook, never had any products about Sandy Hook. The films we would try to really vet and do more journalistic research into and fact check and interview uh, renowned people. I mean, I interviewed like former U.S. Attorney Generals and members of Congress and former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, that's who we would go for these films. Top economists, you know, just really big names for these films. And they were very, very popular. So that's where I've been journalistic and done a good job. I guess with the age of the internet, people grabbing clips out of talk radio or talk TV and mixing it together, I can see how um, it could you know, cause problems. That's why I've admitted that I've made a lot of mistakes, but none of it was done from some master plan uh, deal. It was done from a bedroom in my house. Sustained. So one of the things I notice uh, about you is that you have a very uh, distinctive voice. Um, very deep, sort of gravelly voice. Uh, did your voice always sound that way? No. What What happened to your voice? Why does it sound the way it does? Well, I remember the two demonstrations where I finally wrecked it. Um, and one was about, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. <coughs> it was actually film of it. I don't know, Jackson, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Why his voice has changed? Do you have some way to tie this to the damages portion of this? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'll address you if I'm talking to you. Uh, this is so that the jury can understand who my client is and, and properly assess his credibility, his demeanor. Sustain. Let me um, ask you directly about. Infowars, as we're coming into the period where Sandy Hook occurs, okay? Yes. About how many employees did you have circa 2012? I'd say about 45, 50. And where were you broadcasting from? What year? 2012. Oh, I was broadcasting from offices, studio. In terms of size, how does that compare to, for example, the New York Times in terms of how many employees? Objection, speculation. I don't believe this witness has any personal knowledge about the New York Times. 
So you can only answer the question if you have actual knowledge about how many employees the New York Times has. Otherwise, you have to say, I don't know. So as a, as a member of the media, are you generally familiar with the different media organizations that are in the, uh, in the industry? Yes. And based on that knowledge of the industry, can you tell us size-wise how your organization compares to the New York Times or to CNN? It's between one one hundredth and one twentieth the size of those different organizations if you count for employees and bureaucracy and the number of offices and things they do. So I want to ask you some questions about the different formats of the different shows that InfoWars broadcasts. Can you tell us what the sort of different segments are that would appear on a given day at InfoWars circa 2012? There was my four-hour radio show that in 2012 was just a webcam on me for people that wanted to watch it online. And then it was just it was me at a desk with a camera in 2012. And then, um, I mean, that was it, basically. At some point, did you all begin to have additional segments besides just you doing your radio show and answering calls? Well, yes, I mean, that's... Now I understand what your first question was. What was the different types of media we were doing? Yeah. There was the syndicated radio show that was also had a visual component, you know, digital video online, and then there was documentary making, and that's what I had 10 or so people working on with me, and then I started to develop reporters and people to go out and actually cover like live events and protests and things that were going on. Uh, and then we also did everything in-house, so we had our own shipping department uh, to be able to ship out you know, books and films, not just my books and films, but a lot of other authors books and films, we interview a lot of those authors. And so that's what we were doing uh, back then. Now, the, your, uh, your radio show, was it purely uh, a call-in show? Or did you also go sort of on, on rants about different issues that you were seeing? Yes, we would, we would have a lot of calls. Sometimes the whole show would be calls. Sometimes it would be all guests. Sometimes I would... Uh, just decided I had so much news that I was going to just cover up to a hundred stories on there and just look at them. The audience knows whether it's the BBC or whether it's an Infowars story or, or whatever it is, they can choose, they can go look it up for themselves. We're just covering what's in this. And so we just bam, bam, bam. Uh, it's, it's the same way today, like Pelosi's in Taiwan, what do you think of it? You think there's going to be a war, the Chinese are threatening war. Oh look, uh, Biden fell down again. Oh, look, uh, you know, that they found another trailer full of 50 dead people in Texas. This is horrible. we, we got to do something about this. And it's just coming up next. It's real simple. i got a stack of news. Uh, we're going to play a video clip of Bill Maher, um, you know, saying we need to depopulate the, the human population. And we got, let's take calls. What do you think about Bill Maher saying we should get rid of the majority of people? Well, who's going to do that? You know, who's going to do the killing? I think this is wrong. I think it's dangerous. I think it sounds like Hitler. I mean, that's what we do. And how did... Um at the time, 2012, how did you all source the, or how did you source the stories that you wanted to cover during that segment of your talk radio or? or 95 percent of what we were covering was mainstream news going, look, they're saying this, do you believe it? Or what do you make of this? Uh, I mean, it's that kind of thing, is that we would simply do what talk radio does. That's what talk radio does. That's what Larry King did, is stack the news articles, talk about what's going on, what people are saying, ask callers, what do you think of that, do you buy that, what do you think is going to happen next, uh, are there really WMDs in Iraq, are they lying about it, and then the talk show hosts make their predictions about what they think, and then the talk radio listeners basically keep note and see who's the most accurate, and it becomes a big game to see who has made the best predictions, and things like that and so that kind of lends itself to to the very nature of a soapbox is people speculating that's that's the nature of people going to a park and, and standing up at speaker's corner in london for 600 years and giving their opinion that's what free speech is now please tell the members of the jury has your uh, method 
where you, you get your stories, has that changed over the years from 2012 until today? No, it's not really changed. I mean, we have clips from the news where it's like, here's a clip of this person saying this. And we always try to actually play it in context. That's most of our clips are about two minutes long. So they're not little deceptive clips. We want to show what somebody actually said. And we'll just play a clip, give our opinion, and ask callers what they think about it. Or, again, we'll say, should Pelosi go to Taiwan? The Chinese are threatening war. And I said yesterday, I said, I don't really like Pelosi. And I don't want war with China, but I think it's good she's going because we should stand up for ourselves and not be pushed around. And then we take calls and say, what do you think? Well, I think you're wrong. We shouldn't go over there. I think you're right. I mean, it's really that simple. Do you also, uh, did you then and do you now also host debates? We do. How do you decide um, to host a debate and who are going to be the debaters? Any issue that is being contested that people think is interesting. We had a Sandy Hook debate where we had a newspaper reporter on who said he thought that it really happened. And we had like a professor, or I forget exactly who on, who, who, who thought that there was questions. And that's the type of thing that we did. And I can understand then that people, again, take clips out of that and move that around and that it, it could cause problems. And that's why now, I mean, I can say I'm, I'm more timid, even though the, the head of the state police questions Uvalde in Texas, and even though they stood down for 77 minutes, I think it happened. But I've just gone, whoa, I'm going to try to leave this alone as much as possible just because they'll take what I've said out of context. But my listeners are now mad at me because I'm not covering it when, I mean, something went on 77 minutes and the kids are begging for help and the police just stand there and the state, the state police in Texas say that the head of the state police says we don't know the truth. And it's because of things like that that people just get completely blown away and confused by what's going on. But now I realize that those are such touchy subjects that I don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And is that a result of this case? And, 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 you know, it's a result of a lot of stuff. Like, in the past, I would have gotten in a car and driven down there. And I think that's what journalists should do. But I, we didn't go down there because I don't want to be associated with the corporate media and the lawyers and the people that swarm around these mass shootings. I don't want to be like them. So they've accused me of being Mr. Mass Shooting and all this stuff with Sandy Hook when I've covered less than one-tenth of one percent over the years. And so I don't want to be like them. So we need to send reporters to Uvalde and the American people can figure out what's going on. But, but I'm not going to get involved in it. So we've talked about the call-in portion. We've talked about hosting debates. Do you also um, interview, and I think we talked about doing the news, based on what you're reading, do you also uh, interview guests? I do. And do you, do you always select the guests that you're going to interview, or sometimes does one of your producers suggest to you, hey, you should interview this person? In radio, the producer isn't the person paying for it. You know, in Hollywood or TV, the person paying for the entertainment show is called the producer. In radio, it just means the booker. And then they call and get the guests on the line or on Skype, and they check into the person. We get all these guest offers and things. In the past, I would do cursory stuff and sometimes mail it in with guests. That's just what talk radio does. I mean, I was a producer for other shows 25 years ago, not just my own show, and they were pressuring us. I was helping a produce on a sports show to get up to five guests an hour. So you're just calling people that are already you know in the news, they're sportscasters or pundits, just like ESPN now, you see all these different writers and talk shows on the show. So it, it, it's the same for political stuff. You're just you're just getting guests that are in the news, that are interesting, and then getting their opinion about things. And so now most of the time though, I say, I want this person, I want that person, um, and I'm more in control of the guest that I have. But, but in the past, um, more, we let more things driven by the internet and by 4chan and 8chan that in every case I've had problems has been a curse. I'm not thanking everybody that's on there, but that's, I tell my producers, do not touch it when it's on there because it, it's just, it's the kiss of death and it causes nothing but problems. Why, um, why is it, do you think it's important 
to interview people who um, are causing a stir on the internet or on social media? Why do you feel like that's a good thing to do in terms of your listeners? Well, I mean, most of the time we're not just interviewing people that have caused a stir. When I say, like, there's a big controversy or there's a big story, if there's riots in Hong Kong and we can find a reporter who will come on the show, we get them on. It's whatever the big topic is. That's just how news is. Uh, and, and, and more and more, I don't really follow the news model of covering the news. In the past I did, but we still do it a lot. But now I mainly just talk about philosophy and the big picture and then have some guests on, and the show's gotten more Christian, you know, because I'm a Christian, but as things progress, all things happening in the world, I'm moving more towards uh, doing a self-help, uh, life experience type show than the political show. In fact, I've been trying to segue out of this just because I think we have to change individuals, kind of like Scarlett was saying earlier, more than we're going to change the world. If we can't change ourselves, then we're never going to be able to change the world. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've learned a lot in that process. And I've also learned how the corporate media is able to completely manipulate a story once you're caught in it, and then manipulate other people. And if anything, I want to teach people about how that process worked because they say I'm the mastermind that figured out how to manipulate people and I didn't have any understanding of it coming and, and now I've seen it from the inside the way this stuff goes on and I again I think only getting the individual awake and aware and, and not under its control is the way to beat it and you can't just cover a bunch of news and get somebody to understand that you you can't be told about the matrix you got to see it Let's slow down a little bit, and um, I want to ask you about sort of how your, with these responsibilities, how your typical day sort of shapes up, okay? How many hours a day are you on the air? I'm on the air about four hours a day. And since when have you been on the air about four hours? I've been on the air four hours a day since about 1997, 98. And in order to prepare for those four hours that you're going to be on the air every day, well, let me ask you this, how many days a week? I'm on the air uh, six days a week. So in order to prepare for four hours a day, six days a week, how many hours per day do you spend on prep for your show? I spend about two hours at night and about two hours in the morning, and then I do some research in the afternoon. In addition to prepping for your show for about four hours and being on the air for about four hours, do you have other responsibilities? I do. And what are your other business responsibilities? Well, we don't have a lot of sponsorship because with sponsorship comes the control of the sponsor's political views. And so we, we sell books and films and other things uh, to fund ourselves. And then you've got to source that, you've got to have that, you got to get the deals on that because a lot of times, like in the case of horrible food, we're only making 20, 30% on it. Uh, so it's, 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 you're, you're competing against Amazon. And so you've got to really spend some time on that. And about how many, so how about how many hours per day do you spend on general business administration as well? Two or three hours. So your average day, would you say, is somewhere between 11 hours, 12 hours a day? Yes. Six days a week? Yes. Do you depend on other people to help you produce your show and decide what you're going to talk about? I do. I depend on my crew, and I depend on, um, I mean, really what they do is they just give me hundreds of clips that are in mainstream news, alternative news, things that are happening, video clips, and I'll sit through them my computer and just review them, and then I tell them just print me the top stories off of 10 or 15 news sources, and I say go through everything, randomly change it up, uh, so everything from Japanese news to 
news in Mexico to, to you know the BBC to uh, the LA Times uh, to just everything, and then also alternative media. Uh, but more and more, we just show clips of what's actually happening out in the world. It's not disputed. There's just stacks of news. You can be on air 24 hours a day. All you're doing is like a curator just showing people, hey, we looked at this, we think it's interesting, we looked at that. Uh, the, the idea that there's like certain stories that are like these big bonanza stories that we focus on is, is, is just not the case. There is a glut of news and information. So we've talked about your responsibilities and your duties and your work today at InfoWars. Do you also appear on uh, other people's shows? Yes, I've, I've been on thousands of different programs in the last 27, 28 years. Any that we would have heard of? I've been on Howard Stern and on his network many times. I have been on Joe Rogan's show many times, even predating his current podcast, more than 25 years. I've been on The View. I've been on Piers Morgan. I've been on 20 or 30 BBC shows. I've been on Japanese television. I've been on, I've been on Saudi Arabian TV. I've been on Israeli TV. I've been, I mean, I basically, I've been on Brazilian television, Brazilian radio, Mexican TV and radio. I mean, I've been on basically a lot. Let's focus in, in the year 2012, how many hours per day was InfoWars broadcasting? Not just your show, but everything. Well, there's broadcasting, and then there's just videos that we're uploading. I mean, I'd say... How many hours of content? Six hours, seven hours. Okay, and um, in 2013, about how many hours per day? 2018? No, 2013. Oh, 2013. Uh, the same amount. And 2014? I'd say a little more, maybe seven. And 15? The same. 16? The same. 17? <coughs> sorry, just one second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not torn larynx. That's why my voice is like that. Uh, so, uh, sorry, what are you saying? I was asking you how many hours per day um, content is being produced and uploaded or streamed on InfoWars in 2017. Probably seven, eight hours as well. And 18? Then it increases to 10 hours a day. Or in 17 it did. Okay. In 17 it increases to 10 hours a day. And then in, um, that stayed about that. And it stayed con constant now at about 10 hours per day since then? It, 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 there's 10 hours that's always there that's talk radio on TV. And then we also put out some other reports and videos. Okay, so the answers you just gave us of seven hours per day basically up until 2016 and then starting in 2017, 10 hours per day, that is content that's on the radio that's being streamed. And being picked up by some radio stations. So, as we sit here today, since 2017, InfoWars has been producing about 3,120 hours of content per year. I haven't done the math. Is, is that what that calculates out to? I will represent to you that it is. It's, uh, I mean, six days a week. We do a little bit less on uh, Sunday, sometimes do stuff on Saturday. I mean, that, that sounds about right. There's no exact number. I never, we never organize it all, so I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. When did you start bringing on other hosts that have their own programs? We started the nightly news in like 2000, like 2000, 
2015, I, can't, I don't have the exact dates. So, so we started the nightly news that David Knight and, and Leanne McAdoo and others would host sometime before the 2016 election. How did you pick who was going to be the first uh, the first host for the nightly news? Well, I hosted it sometimes, and so did David Knight, mainly. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a really bad deal here. Um, you need some more water? No, it, it's, it, it, I've, it's a torn larynx. It's had a lot worse. It's real bad this week, so this is going on. It's losing the <coughs> voice like that. Um, it, it'll get better in a minute. What were you saying? I was asking if... Uh, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. If uh, David Knight won a contest in order to be on the show. Yes, he did. Tell us about how that worked. We had a contest of news videos and reports to the best. And I think I don't think he won. I, I think he entered the contest. <coughs> but then we we uh, hired him. He came out with his family from North Carolina. And he, he was an engineer and also had done a lot of uh, writing for publications and things. And so <coughs> he was just a natural for the show. Mr. Jones. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I just, I just meant to have surgery on this. It's, it's been like this for 10 years, but it's really bad now. So. That's the exception to the food in the courtroom. <laughs> there you go. You're nice to me. All right, go ahead. Um, Alex, uh, you obviously have a very busy work schedule to yourself. For yourself, do you tell the other hosts what to say or what to cover? <coughs> We're starting to. <laughs> well, I mean, no, not the past. Not really. Very rarely. Other than I try to pick people that I already have done shows that I've seen their work that I think are trying to tell the truth, that are smart, and who are funny. I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, but they're definitely, we're trying to put in more, more oversight and be more careful, obviously, about what we do. We've, we've definitely learned a lesson from this process of not just things we did wrong, but how people misrepresent what we've done. Is it fair to say that yourself and most of your hosts are self-taught uh, through the radio business? Owen has a degree in, in media. But he'll tell you he didn't learn anything with that. It was all working at those radio stations from the bottom, you know, up. He got on air at the top. And it was the same way. Owen had a similar deal that I did. I mean, I volunteered when I was at Talk Radio. Um, I wasn't paid the first six months, and then I got into sales and things. But I was I was doing producing for sports shows. We uh, I even got hired by the Howard Stern Show uh, to do a, a interview with uh, Dennis Hopper. And, and some other folks at, at, at a big film festival at the Governor's Mansion. Uh, so I did that, I and mean, I've worked for Howard Stern on that job. Uh, so I was doing everything. And then that was unpaid uh, to, 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 to do that. Would you say that your organization is more like a, a radio show or more like a, like a newspaper like the, uh, the Austin States? No, we don't pretend to be... We're more like the op-ed page in a newspaper, giving our opinion than, say, the investigative journal section of something. So yes, we're, we're like the op-ed, or we're like the funny papers in, 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 as well. I mean, we've got really serious stuff we do, where we say, here's the documents, here's where they said it, this is what's going on, and then we also have the op-ed opinion stuff we do, which is what talk radio is, and then we also um, have satire and uh, you know things like that, where it's completely obvious that I'm dressed up in like like Cobra Commander, that I'm not actually Cobra Commander. People know that's a joke. Let's talk a little bit about where you get your funding. Um, when's the last time you had a, a corporate sponsor for InfoWars? You mean a big one? Yeah. I had some corporate sponsors when I was against George George Herbert, George W. Bush and the war. We lost a lot because we were anti-war, but we still had some big ones. I mean, we had like car companies, 
uh, clothing lines, everything. We were making a lot of money to expand the operation. Going back to about 2005, up to when Obama got in. And then being anti-war was not allowed anymore. For whatever reason, I wasn't anti-Obama, I was anti-war. So I continued with being anti-war. And we lost all our sponsors. We lost, uh, that was almost, was about 80% of the money we were making with sponsors. You know, started, we lost about $10 million. That was gross money to fund the operation right away when uh, we didn't uh, didn't toe the line with all the wars. And so when you lost all that corporate sponsorship because of your your position against the war, did uh, you transition to a different business model? Yes. We'd already been selling some books and films, but we accelerated it. And I said, well, I'm not going to let them shut me down. I said this on air. I said, you want to shut us down over $10 million a year, I'm going to... I remember saying, I'm going to go to $70 million a year, and I'm going to put it into everything, we're going to advertise, we're going to explode. And so that was my promise, and I fulfilled it. And why is it important for you to be self-funded? That's what the system fears, that it's actually come out in some of the presidential library documents out of uh, Little Rock, that they the system fears any independent organic media, whether it's liberal or conservative, that isn't controlled by the big corporations. They want a fake left and a fake right that's synthetic. And, and by fake, they're, they're real groups. They just kind of toe a line, stay within certain guardrails, and then society doesn't ever change for the better. Instead, we need independent grassroots media that is self-funded, whether it be through donations or whether it be through product sales, so that we can have real diversity of ideas in this world we live in. What do you, you use the term synthetic as well as fake. What do you mean when you say synthetic? You know, these are a lot of military terms that I learned just by researching psychological warfare because I knew that they were using it against us. So I went and last 20 years got some of the declassified ones. But a synthetic event is real stuff happening, but they put in place people to help it happen. They kind of provocateur to get it started. It's like you have two pit bulls killing each other. That's a real event, but people that throw them in that pen together for that fight, they made it happen. They brought the dogs there. They raised the dogs. They trained them how to fight. They threw them in the pit. So there's two dogs really killing each other, but it's synthetic because people made it happen. So when I talk about staged, most of the time I mean they knew it was going to happen, and they stood down and let it happen. And that was my view the first few years of Sandy Hook. Anybody can pull up the Washington Post, you name it, about FBI going out there, him threatening to ship a school, nothing being done. Same story, CIA, he was hacking stuff. Was that, so that's where everybody thought it was really suspicious up front was because those telltale signs that we've seen before of those type of synthetic connections, which don't always mean it was staged, but that's the type of things people look for. So, so you've, got, you've got different types of false flags, you've got... Synthetic is, 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 is a way to describe it really happened, but there were, there were forces in there letting it happen. Is this kind of like the idea of, of purposely focusing people on a particular news story because you want them to vote a certain way or do a certain thing? A synthetic event. Wait, 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 wait. When you hear objection, you have to stop. Objection, please. Sustain. Give us another example of how that would work. Well, take that clip earlier today they aired. At the beginning of the clip, I say I, I believe Scarlett Lewis is, is real. I believe her son died. I'm very, very sorry. And they cut that off the front. And then they cut me saying I'm sorry off the end. And they brought a real clip, but it's synthetic, to try to deceive you. And I hope you get to see the real clip. And then you'll figure out everything else that's been going on. Let's go back to... InfoWars and its business model. Um, do you sell vitamins? Yes. Are your vitamins FDA certified? No, they're not. Why not? 1996 law, the FDA has no jurisdiction over any nutraceuticals, not the ones at Whole Foods, not the ones at GNC, and not ours. And ours are private labeled, top brands that are sold at Whole Foods and G 
you'd see, we have it made by the top lab recognized in the United States. All we do is put our label on it so we know it's triple tested, the highest quality, and that's why people love it because it is the best out there. And I'll give it to Whole Foods, and I'll give it to GNC and others. They've got the same stuff. There's all sorts of crap you can buy at a gas station out there. That's not what ours is. I mean, we buy our PQQ and, and CoQ10 from the Japanese. I mean, it's the best. It costs five times what synthetic PQQ and CoQ10 cost. Looks like some type of sales log. And can you tell us what year it begins in? Uh, looks like uh, September 2015. And can you flip to the last page and tell us what year it ends? It ends. It ends in December 2018. If you flip back to the front, can you see the headings? Yes. Can you see the column that you're at? Yeah. Don't worry, it's not COVID, it's the torn larynx. <coughs> sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we're sorry, go ahead. There is a uh, column that is labeled invoice. Uh -huh. Yes. Would that represent gross sales? I believe so. And let's flip to the last page and you can tell us what the gross sales number is. $165,230,000. Can you tell the members of the jury how much of that represents profit versus just gross revenue? The, it depends on what product it is. Some products make 20%, some products make 60%. Like on a book, you know, you might be 20, 30% on food, it's that, and that's the biggest type things. Um, on supplements, if they're on sale, you make 50% of it. If it's not on sale, uh, you make you know, more than that, sometimes a 100% markup, uh, but usually it's on sale. So it, it, it really all depends. I can tell you bottom line numbers, though, uh, of, of how much money I've been paid, things like that, or how much money's there. Before we, we discuss that, let's, um, let's talk about InfoWars, the organization. Would you describe it as organized or chaotic? It's a mix of both, but it is the opposite of corporate and there's no corporate culture, and there's no, um, people are very happy there overall, and it's very, very diverse, and people stay there a long time. And, but, but I would say the sales department and, and, the, and the shopping cart, that's in another building, it's not even there. And it's kind of like two groups that normally talk to each other. So the disorganization is between people who do production and the people that do the sales in the warehouse and stuff, and we're trying to get that integrated. But 
Let me, maybe this is an easier way to go after it. Let's discuss, for example, email. How much email does InfoWars routinely get? I, I, mean, I, I mean, I know when we look to comply with the discovery, which we complied with, it was over 10 million that they had a search that was still in the inbox unopened. So it was 10 million unopened and a few hundred thousand opened. And uh, that's why there's a lot of stuff we never saw because it was in the 10 million emails. So about how much email would you say you get on a given day just sent by random people? I can't answer that because about 10 years ago I got rid of my email address because it was getting 20,000 a day. And so that's that's that was one of the things they didn't believe there wasn't an Alex in InfoWars because, well, of course you got an email. I'm like, no, I don't. Uh, and uh, that's like it doesn't exist because I can't read that. It's just I can't read 20,000 emails. How many employees would InfoWars have to have, in your view, if you were to actually read every message, every email, every tip that's sent in? It would take 10, 15, 20 people we go bankrupt, which we are now. Um, going back to, I want to ask you a question. There's a, a term that's been thrown around um, during this trial of, of the truther community or truth people. Um, what does that... That really depends on you, Mr. Ringston, whether you think I need to hear them now or later. I'm, I'm worried they need to hear from Mr. Ringston, so I'd like to... All right. Um, we're going to just, just sit tight for a second. We're going to take a break. I don't know if it will eat up the rest of the afternoon or not. So I'm not going to release you in case it doesn't. I want to not waste any time. Um, and so I'll send someone back if you're going to go or if you're going to come back. Remember all of my instructions. On the chance that I don't see you before tomorrow, please arrive at 845 like normal for us to get started. All right, thank you. All rise. Wait until the jury has moved to their space before you can leave the room. All right. Hmm? All right, Mr. Bankston. I don't know what's going on, Your Honor, but I need to bring a couple of motions there for jury instructions, and then I'm going to go ahead and bring a motion for sanctions right now on the record. I know you don't want to hear it from the other side, but the jury instructions are coming now. Um, we have, as you know, there's been a pattern of Mr. Reynolds lately violating MIO's and court rules. Um, it, it, Mr. Reynolds just absolutely solicited direct testimony from Mr. Jones that he is bankrupt. Mr. Jones just testified straight into the record that he's bankrupt, which is not true, which is a sham that's going on right now, which Mr. Jones pulled $60 million out of his company last year. But the most important part, Your Honor, is you have a, stand, you have a motion limiting entered in this case that is in no uncertain terms that they cannot, due to violating your orders repeatedly to provide networks information, they cannot apply evidence. Mr. Jones just intentionally did that in violation of your order to attempt to poison this compensatory damage verdict to try to tell this jury that he's broke and that he's not. And that's in violation of your order. And Mr. Randolph drew that right out of him, totally expecting that to happen. It was very obvious from the question he asked, once Mr. Jones to tell this jury he's broke. That is ridiculous. The second is that he absolutely, Mr. Jones just fully testified that we complied with discovery. I am under the standing MIO not permitted to mention discovery disputes. But we both know Mr. Jones did anything but comply with discovery and did that for four years, thumbing his nose in the face of this court in rank contempt. There needs to be an instruction to the jury that he did not comply with discovery. 
that materials that were repeatedly ordered by this court will not turn over. Some of that includes net worth information. And you were, I also would like an instruction to the jury to disregard and strike his comments that about him being bankrupt, which they are to take as having no evidentiary value and is not true. Uh, otherwise, I am deeply prejudiced going forward. The other thing that Mr. Jones testified to is that he doesn't, doesn't communicate by email, doesn't have emails to turn on. You know from a motion for sanctions that involved defendants' former counsel tampering with evidence that they tampered with a piece of evidence to hide the fact from me that Mr. Jones does have an email and was communicating with him. To this date, we still don't know what that email is. We don't know, I haven't been produced any of it, but Mr. Jones has just repeatedly lying on the stand in ways that I cannot counter because they deal with your discovery rules. Um, I want the jury to be instructed to disregard all of that testimony, that, that it has been already found by the court that Mr. Jones does have an email, that he did not turn those emails over, and did not admit and deny the existence of that email, that he did not comply with discovery, that he is not bankrupt and the jury is not to consider him. Additionally, on top of those instructions, we are now formally moving for sanctions against both Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, who we believe intentionally solicited testimony to sabotage this jury. And I would not normally make that accusation so openly against a fellow attorney had that attorney not continually violated rules of this court on every single day including before putting Mr. Jones on, clearly attempting to solicit from a witness an attorney-client communication earlier into this day, which, as we've seen him violate rules that a first-year law student should know, a first-day law student should know not to ask the plaintiff about her communications with counsel. This is absolutely in bad faith. Therefore, we'd like jury instructions and we're filing a motion for sanction. Would you like to respond, Mr. Raymond? If Your Honor thinks it necessary, I will. I think that Your Honor can review the transcript of my questions. I don't think my questions elicited that testimony. Uh, I'm sorry that that came out. I don't think that there was anything I could have done in my questioning uh, that that would have prevented it from happening. I know that Your Honor has contemporaneous transcript and can look it over. So I, I would urge you to do so um, because I, you know, I'm sorry it happened. I tried to move on very, very quickly. I think Your Honor saw me raise my hand. Um, but I can only ask the question. Let me ask Mr. Jones a couple of questions while you're under oath. Yes, sir. Yes, what did your attorney tell you about your testimony today? Not, I want to be very careful. Um, were you instructed that there were some things you could not testify about? Yes. And do you remember what they were? Yes. And what were they? Just top level. I'm trying to remember that first there was a the document you put out saying don't talk about free speech, don't uh, don't say I'm innocent, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other stuff, and then and then that got withdrawn. You, I believe you withdrew it. I think it's called motion and limiting. Okay. So you don't remember. No, no, no. I, I, no. I, I remember currently stop. Do you remember day one where I said it's an unfair world and you don't get to interrupt the judge? Do you remember I'm that? Sure. Yeah, okay. But the judge gets to interrupt you. Do okay. you remember that? Yeah. Um, okay, so you don't really remember what you were not supposed to testify about. That's what I'm hearing because you said, yes, I remember. No, I don't remember. Well, let me, I'm trying to remember. Okay, um, I don't want you to try and remember. No, I, I, I don't want you to try and remember. You either knew or you don't. Um, I remember him saying, don't talk about. Don't talk about the financial stuff or something like that, like a week ago when I asked him. And then I remember today watching part of Heslin's testimony when I was coming here and him talking about the bankruptcy. So I thought that was totally fine. I mean, he gets to do Why, why not just do what he gets to do? Mr. Jones, no. stop making. Just stop. Okay. All right. Um, you can sit down, Mr. Jones. Okay. Do you have any reply, Mr. Bingson? Uh, not really. And I'm actually, good. before I hear from you, you know whose obligation it is, Mr. Raynal, to make sure that any witness you put forward understands the orders in limine, understands what he is not allowed to say because of orders that I have made before now, right? As an attorney, it's an impossible position. That wasn't to be the question in. I asked you. I would. 
I know that it is my obligation to communicate your honor's orders. Beyond that, I, I think that's all I need. You know, the only thing I was saying, I actually probably do need to ask for an additional jury instruction. Uh, during the same testimony, and the reason why I do not believe that Mr. Raynal was keeping a tight leash on the spine for MIL, and why I do believe he was intentionally trying to violate them, is Mr. Raynal had a long series of questions about whether Mr. Jones is a pundit who merely gives his opinion, does not provide facts, was not stating facts, was only giving his opinion. That's another one of your motion on the Defendants cannot contest in this case that the statements that they were giving were merely protected opinions and not statements of fact. That all came out intentionally for Mr. Raynal, and you know too through the rest of this testimony that he's been intentionally trying to drive out the viability section of the jury. As we said yesterday, we think he's intentionally trying to bring this trial. And if, and if it, it really is a matter of, oh, whoops, I guess I forgot to remind my client not to suddenly blurt out to the jury that he's broke on the day when he was screaming that he's going to do it. Right? When he says, I'm going to come in there and I'm, this judge ain't going to hold me down. It's going to be her Waterloo. And then he comes in here and do that. Maybe we'd forgive, forgive it if he wasn't also asking questions that were directly in violation of motion. And, Your Honor, we believe this is just egregious. Your Honor, if All I right. may on that point, just on that point, um, Your Honor has ruled already that during this phase of the trial, we are to discuss, and, and I, over my objection, all the issues raised by Rule 41, 11. I, I've been objecting to that. Except I, net worth. Well, except net worth. And within that, for the jury to make an accurate determination, you need to talk about intent. You need to talk about degree of malice. You need to talk about how extreme the behavior was or wasn't. And so the testimony I'm eliciting, which I believe I, I've never said, nor has my client said, that your honor's ruling shouldn't stand. But in order for the jury to be able to make a decision, they need to know the entire context and they need to understand the mental state of the participants. Because if not, they can't well, render a ruling on the punitive damages. The problem is, and you know this, and we've already had this conversation multiple times in this trial, in addition to it before this trial, the time for that was during discovery, when Mr. Jones chose not to fully participate. It is not the time to do that now. If there is anything that he would like to put forth as a defense, he needed to do it a year ago during the discovery process. It's too late now. And when you ask questions that imply or outright say that he didn't know how to be a journalist or he wasn't a journalist, you're calling into question my ruling, which was based on a long-standing principle in the law, that if you intentionally, repeatedly, and over years, in this case, again and again, refuse to participate in discovery, that is proof that you do not have a meritorious defense. That was the basis of my ruling. You cannot attack that in this trial. For motions to, for sanctions, you've got to write them down. They're under advisement until they're written down and filed. We'll take that up post-trial. Your Honor, so that I don't run afoul of your ruling. I'm not done. I'm sorry. You don't even know what it is yet. For the motions seeking sanctions against Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, you have to write those down. They have to be filed with the court. I'll take them up post-trial. That may mean during deliberations. That may mean later in August. I don't know. Assume it'll be as soon as I have time, so file a response if you want to. Mr. Jones, you may not say to this jury that you complied with discovery. That is not true. You may not say it again. 
you may not tell this jury that you are bankrupt. That is also not true. You may have filed for bankruptcy. I don't know that, but I've heard that. It doesn't put, that doesn't make a person or a company bankrupt. You're already under oath to tell the truth. You've already violated that oath twice today in just those two examples. It seems absurd to instruct you again that you must tell the truth while you testify. Yet here I am. You must tell the truth while you testify. This is not your show. You need to slow down and not take what you see as opportunities to further the message you're wanting to further. And instead, only answer the specific and exact question you have been asked. No asides. The comments about discovery the comments about the larynx or whatever it was, the comments about bankruptcy, none of those were responsive to questions. They were just you abusing my tolerance and making asides to the jury improperly and in <coughs> these two cases, untruthfully. Do you understand what I have said? Yes I, or no? Do you understand what I have said? Yes, I believe what I said was true. So yes, you believe everything you say is true, but it isn't. Your beliefs do not make something true. That is, that is what we're doing here. Just because you claim to think something is true does not make it true. It does not protect you. It is not allowed. You are under oath. That means things must actually be true when you say them. Don't talk. You understand what I have said. I do understand. You understand the instructions I have given you for your testimony in court. Yes. I'm not going to bring the jury back today. My staff is listening. They can let the jury go home. We'll start back up tomorrow. When you come back to testify tomorrow, one more time, no asides. Do you understand what I mean when I say no asides? Yes. Answer only the question asked of you. Do you understand what I mean when I say only answer the question asked of you? Yes. You understand you will still be under oath when you return tomorrow morning to yes. complete your testimony. And you understand that that means you must only testify about things that are true. To the best of my knowledge. If you don't know something, you don't say it. If you're asked about your opinion, you can give your opinion. But if you're asked to relate something that's <coughs> truthful and a fact, it must be truthful and a fact. Not an assumption, not a guess, not an opinion. Do you understand? Yes. All right. You can sit down. Anything else? Yes, sir. Just so that I can make sure that I don't run afoul of your Honor's motion to eliminate or earlier rulings. Just to be clear, we call them motions. I don't issue motions. I issue orders. These are orders in limine. and have been ordered since before this trial started. Is your Honor ordering me not to explore the nature of the wrong? That is very broad. <laughs> the character of the conduct involved. You may not elicit testimony designed to leave the jury with the impression that Mr. Jones and the Free Speech Systems did not defame Mr. Heslin or that Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems did not engage in the intentional infliction of emotional distress against Ms. Lewis and Mr. Heslin. May I elicit evidence as to the low degree of culpability that should be ascribed to free speech systems and to Alex Jones by virtue of 
his education, his situation, the situation of info wars, uh, and what was going on. So Mr. Jones was too ignorant to know that he was lying? Is that your defense? Your Honor, my defense is for the jury, not for the court. Uh, I'm asking whether I can elicit testimony as to uh, his mental state, to the organization of the company, to the standard practices in his industry, um, to uh, what was going on in his personal life, um, all to illustrate the low degree of culpability that should be attributed to you can ask Mr. Jones questions about similar to some of the questions or all the questions that were allowed um, when Ms. Karpova was on stand that kind of touch on these same areas that were allowed. I think those are fair game. Um, you can ask him I mean, I think the answer is yes, as long as you're very careful. Very well. Anything else from you, Mr. Reynolds? No. Anything else from you, uh, Mr. Reynolds? The only thing is I wanted to confirm with you that, that we'll be, tomorrow morning we'll be taking up whether there will be instructions and should I propose instructions to the board? Yes, please propose the exact instruction you would like me to give. I think it would be appropriate to give those instructions, if any, before Mr. Jones retakes the stand. Um, yeah. One second, please. I think we need something. We need some instruction. So you can do it the way you did the proposed charge instructions. You can both send my office an email if you would like to. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Jones would like to say something that's directly relevant to what we've been discussing. I, I am not. Very briefly, Your Honor. I think it's important for, for my I, candor towards the court that you okay. hear what he has to say. I, I, I am not typically in the process <coughs> of hearing from parties except when they are on the stand. And I don't see a reason to change that practice any more than I already have. I would, this is simply in line with your honor's question as to what he was instructed in terms of what he should testify about. It doesn't matter at this stage. I expect that you will go over the instructions as you are required to do under the rules, and I'm going to leave it there. Anything else? Nothing else, Your Honor. either of you attorneys. Oh, well, let's do a time check. Um, we're certainly going longer than I think we have all sort of hoped. Mr. Reynal, you've used 10 hours and 33 minutes. The, uh, and today it's very inflated because all the breaks I just attributed to extra, so it looks like we've worked, well we have worked, but it's more than five and a half hours for today. So the sort of extra category is seven hours and six minutes. Um, and Mr. Bankston, for your side, it's 17 hours and three minutes, so I haven't done the, let me hang on one second, let me figure one thing out. Um, yeah, so today it, it's all out of whack because it's uh, well over six hours, and I don't calculate, I calculated five and a half a day. Anyway, I think we're, we're okay. Um, I'm going to say that we need to conclude I think we will run into a problem and run out of time, potentially, um, if we go past the lunch hour with evidence. Do you have a witness once Mr. Jones is finished? Mr. Jones is already in. Okay. So hopefully we can get that um, in here. Anything else on the record? No, no. Let's go off the record. <coughs> Anything else at all? We've gone over witness to only be Mr. Jones. We've gone over hours. Is there anything else? Will we be arguing tomorrow afternoon? Yes, yes. We will um, do our formal charge conference as soon as Mr. Jones's questions from the jury are concluded. And then, depending on breaks and all of that, we're going to start. We're going to start. All right, anything else? <coughs>
All right. One, one thing, Your Honor. Oh, would you, there is something else. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking, would you, assuming everything goes just swimmingly and as fast as it can tomorrow, which is hard to say to do, um, would you expect us to go into the punitive portion should the jury return a verdict very quickly? Um, so the problem is, you know, I have to read the entire jury charge out loud. Right? Yeah. And then I also have to read, I think it's a page, let me see real quick. It's hard for me to believe that would happen. I just wanted to make Yeah, I don't think it will either. I read a page of other instructions, and then I read the entire charge out loud, which it's not that long. Um, I mean, we have finalized it, but it's only 11 pages. And as you attorneys know, one of those pages is the signature, so it's not that bad. But I still think that's 15 minutes. Um, then when they go back, they don't have any evidence because we have to review it on the record, and then it goes back. So I find it unlikely. How would Your Honor like what evidence we do have to be on a, on a thumb drive? How, how do we do that? So to date, the only exhibits you've admitted are paper. Didn't know there's a video. It's been admitted? It has. And I, I think it's exhibit 67. It was admitted it's without objection. And has it been playing to played to the jury? It has. It's the Father's Day message. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So so far, what I have from you is sixty-seven. That's it, right? Um, where where is it? Because once it's admitted, it's supposed to be up here with my court It's in your honor's computer, courtroom computer. Oh, in that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, so we're going to need, and I'll be honest, I actually don't know what the system back there is. Oh, you know what? It's going to be the exact same system as this because they're deliberating in a neighboring courtroom. So I will need a thumb drive or something similar that contains only, only admitted exhibits admitted to the jury and nothing else. Are you guys listening? Yes, yes sure. Okay. Because the same thing goes for you. So <coughs> if you had something that's a court exhibit, that's fine. You can give that to me separately. Um, we have a few. But the videos are only the ones that are admitted in their admitted form, which for the plaintiff includes the full video and the clips. Does not include the deposition videos. Make sure those are not on there. And this, Your Honor, is PX32 that I uh, moved into evidence today. Great. And leave it up here for Mr. Block. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All rise.